ಹಾಗಾದ್ರೆ David? Lionel. It's another one of those, uh, if you're here, that means that we have to do an introduction because I... Uh, you're not so good at it. No, I'm not so good at I, it. By yourself. No. It's, it's actually kind of painful to listen to, isn't it? It can be. <laughs> I love the fact that you're so uh, honest about that because otherwise people would be wondering, but he's, he's cur- completely correct. And then we have the other problem where I doze off sometimes. Love you like a brother, but uh, by yourself, you just suck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Succinct and to the point. Uh, podcast is great. Guests are great. Me by myself, I suck. Right. It's just, it's just you know, it's just like uh, the the front of the boat is the is the bow, and the back of the boat is the stern. Podcast with me without anybody to talk to, I suck. Um, did you buy a new snowblower? Yes, I did. Something I probably should have done, I don't know, 15 years ago when I moved here, but <clears throat> so we'll... Uh, 15 years? That you haven't had one? I haven't had... I, I Yeah, I had somebody that would plow. And oh, it just, okay. Right. It, was, it was just difficult being dependent on someone. I should have bought a snowblower 15 years ago and just... Sucked it up. Saved all that money. Yeah, it would have been a lot cheaper back then 15 years ago. Uh, I'm sure. What one did you buy? I bought a Cub Cadet. From? Uh, Home Depot. Is, a, is that Cub Cadet have a name? It is uh, it is a 2X30 EFI. Wow. What day did you buy it? Um, I bought it in about the middle of December. Okay. Technically, it was the the, the, 20, the 20th of December. Well, wasn't it uh, $200 cheaper the day before? Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> on the nineteenth, if I had, had I bought it on the nineteenth when I was looking at it, it's just you know, it's whenever you look at something and you say, "Yeah, I'll get it in the morning," eh, don't wait. <laughs> it's going to cost you two hundred bucks. That happens to me all the time with plane tickets. I'm like, I look at it and I go, oh, "Okay, it's uh, you know, my trip to Florida. If I go on this day, it's a hundred two hundred and ten dollars." And I'll go, "Yeah, okay, that's good." Now forget about it. And four days later, I go back and it's three hundred and sixty. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I was taught that when you're going to spend a lot of money, you should probably sleep on it first. Yes, you should. And 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 just not rush into it. And, you know, sometimes you know, that yeah. blows up in your face. I agree 100%. If you're going to buy something, you want to sleep on it. There's much con- there's much uh, hand-wringing right now in the Strang household because I want to buy a new pickup truck because I sold my pickup truck when I get sick. And I want to go back to having a pickup truck. But now I have two young men in their mid thirties who are car salesmen who insist that they're going to help me. It's because they don't sell pickup trucks. No, <laughs> that's but, the problem. But they seem to know everything about every make of car. Yeah. And so I'm like, well, I want to get a Toyota. Well, I got, it's the most gas guzzling truck going. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I want a Toyota. And they're like, it burns more gas than anything. They haven't changed the engine in 16 years and blah, 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 blah. So then they, the two of them get on to, I, they said, well, what else would you buy? I said, well, I could be talked into a Ford, I guess, but it's very confusing buying a Ford because there's so many options. Well, the next thing I know, they're coming up, well, here, buy this one. And I'm like, and they're, expl- they talk so fast. And I'm thinking, it's a salesman. I think I'm being hustled in my own kitchen. Right. By my own son and my own basic adopted son. Uh, you know what? You earned it. Buy what you want. Yeah, that's kind of where I'm at. The biggest gas guzzling. But you know what? I had a thought today. I wanted to buy it on day 2,500, which is just uh, like three, four, five, six, seven months away. Right. But I'm starting to think that that would be uh, kind of a slap in the face to those folks that really are struggling right now with their finances because of the COVID. And I'm thinking, you know, I could probably wait another year just so it's not, I'm just not, look at me, I'm buying a truck while other people are struggling. Because that's something that I always think of. Um, no, I understand that. But you know what? 
you've earned it. Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you know what? Well, well, why don't you and I table that, and we will discuss it as we go along. Okay. All right. So, yes, I definitely want to buy it on day 2,500 of my day count, but I'm thinking now that because of all the situation in the world, and I don't necessarily want to be jamming it down anybody's throat, so I might put that off, not because I don't want to do it, but just because I don't want to be jamming it down anybody's throat, especially uh, people that I know are strong struggling and stuff like that. So anyways, the reason we're here and uh how's your dishwasher going? <laughs> About as well as the snowplow was. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have also acquired a brand new uh dishwasher. Baytac Actually, on the same day as the snowblower. The same day because as it, well because when it rains it pours. Holy mackerel. Yeah. Is that all your AML money that you've earned that you're spending on that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you the. I'll send you. I'll, I'll turn my receipts in. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so what did you get a Maytag? I uh, I bought an LG. I bought a new dishwasher about two and a half months ago, and it stopped running. And I bought an LG. <laughs> yeah. And the guy's fixing it, and he finds this metal piece kind of floating around. He's got the motor all jammed up. And he says, well, there's your problem right there. And he says, oh, yeah. And then he gets on the phone and he's talking with Maytag repair. And apparently that piece wasn't supposed to be put in those motors because it didn't really fit, but they were looking for a chopper. Ah. Then they made a better one. And I'm thinking, well, then why put it in there at all? Right. Save me the trouble. But apparently a lot of people put fairly large clumps of food in their dishwasher and expect the dishwasher to chop that up. You need a, a macerator. A who to, what? To, to, it's called a macerator and it grinds the the food as it's going down the drain. Kind of like a door, like a garbage disposal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to have a two-door macerator. Uh, a coupe. coupe uh, <laughs> <laughs> with a V6 turbocharged. My son's all excited because he says the Ford comes with a v6 twin turbo that gets excellent mileage he says you got it you should get that and i'm like all right i could be taught maybe ford or toyota those are my two choices i'm not going i don't need anybody writing in tell me about dodge or chevy i'm not going that way it's ford or toyota that's it um so okay so this show is about uh the state of the hobby okay so originally it was going to be every year we have Joe Fugate on, who's the editor of Model Railroad Hobbyist. Model, is that it? Model, Ho- Model, Rail- Model Railroad Hobbyist. Yeah, MRH. And he's the editor of that. And then he goes, he tells us about the state of the hobby, or I try to get him to tell us the state of the hobby. A lot of it is the magazine, but that's okay. We're interested in the yearly updates. And uh, so we talked to him. So I t- took a different approach this year. I thought we should hear from more people. So we talked to him for like uh, 45, 50 minutes. And then I thought, who better to talk to about the state of the hobby than our very own Gordy Robinson, who is running for NMRA president and is in fact the director at large for the European region, I guess, or the world or something. Right. And so he's on after Joe Fugate and he is great. He, we have a great discussion with him. Joe's good too, but Gordy is great. I sure hope that Gordy gets elected president because I'm awful proud of that boy. He he he. If anybody deserves it, it's him. It does. He does. He cer- he certainly has worked hard to 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 earn that. Yeah, and I think even on the podcast, I said to him, I said, you know, Gordy, at first you irritated the crap out of me. At first, I thought you were a good young guy. I said, when did we meet? He says, 2017. We had dinner in Orlando. I said, at first I thought you were a good young guy. Continued to think you were a good young guy, but you kind of irritated the crap out of me because you talked fast and I couldn't really understand and you were keeping up and you had all these ideas and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I kind of got, fr- thanks to Kevin Marks, uh, he kind of stuck the bug in my ear that we should not dissuade Gordy's determination to do something good for the NMRA. So I jumped on board a uh, full blast to support Gordy for his bid for president because I started to realize that he's the real deal. Gordy Robinson is the real deal. 
he his, is, his heart is certainly in the right place, and you know he has a lot of great ideas, and and just his he just overflows with enthusiasm. That's yeah, he overflows with enthusiasm. His heart is in the right place. He has a lot of good ideas, and he is legit. Like he is working hard for the region and and the the NMRA. So I asked him, "What is your passion for the NMRA?" And he told me, told, tells us this great story about when he was young, he went to some the re- local region for the NMRA, and the guy, the people there, t- t- uh, the adults treated him so nice. It just was like the best experience he ever had, and it, it fueled him. And now we're get, because of those guys, we're going to end up with a a great president. And I and I'm very excited. Go ahead. I was going to say you would almost think that that was the way it was supposed to work. Yeah. And and if everybody had that experience with the NMRA. It would it would be it would be a great thing. Well, I'll tell you what. If Gordy is elected president, the experience that people are going to have with the NMRA is going to improve dramatically. I agree. He's going to make himself available. He's going to ex- be excited to help people. I really hope that everybody that's listening to this podcast, and this is on the free channel, so there's at least seventy five thousand people listening. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I bet you, you know what? I bet you uh, at l- almost 5,000 people will listen to this podcast over the next year. Okay. Um, so, but we need them all to listen be, by the middle of February because I think that's when you get votes got to be in. So, any, everybody that's listening, please vote for Gordy. You won't be uh, unhappy. Uh, he's a great, great young guy. He is the real deal. The way he is, is the way, the way he seems, is the way he is. And we really hope that he's victorious in that endeavor. We're going to help him as much as we can. But anybody, a- anybody else who wants to come on and talk about whatever position they're running for, we'll we'll have them on too. Absolutely, share everybody's uh, stands. Absolutely. All right, I think that's pretty much covers it all. That, so it's uh, Joe Fugate, and then Gordy Robinson, and then we'll be back. Okay. Okay. Take it away, buddy. Subway chime go. Uh, okay, so uh, we now have uh, Joe Fugate with us. Ron, every year we do the State of the Union with Joe Fugate. Yes. And uh, Joe, can you turn your camera off there? You're a very, you're good, you're a wonderful looking man, but uh, we find that the internet works better with, without using up the bandwidth of the camera. Perfect. Look at that. That's perfect. Uh, so every year since, uh, I think we started doing this, Joe, didn't we start this in about 73? Uh, actually, it wasn't at thirty-seven. Yeah, it could have been. It's been uh, it's been at least forty years. We've yes. been we've been doing it forever. Yes. And uh, every year we talk to Joe about the state of the hobby, and uh, so at Chris at the end of the year or the beginning of the year. So we thought we'd continue on. Joe, we're only probably going to do about thirty minutes tonight because I'm going to try to talk to a couple other people about the state of the hobby because I think the hobby has grown even more in the last year again. Yes. Uh, yes, let's talk about that. Certainly. Yeah, yeah, can we? Because I think the hobby is about to explode, and we're all going to be covered in model railroad goo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so how is it uh, How's it going at the old uh, MRH, model railroad? Joe, for those who don't know. So, Joe, first let me introduce you to Ron Marsh. He had, Ron Marsh is a YouTube model railroad YouTube sensation. He has a YouTube channel called Ron's Trains and Things, which which I'm sure you've seen almost every episode and some of them twice. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it's uh, Ron's Trains and Things. He actually works for what is it? You work for the Model Railroad College or something? Model Railroad Model Railroad Academy. I make some videos for Model Railroad Academy and uh, also partnering starting in January with uh, folks at Model Railroad News. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, did you get any, did they get a, a recommendation to use you or something? Uh, I think there might have been some an anonymous kind of a thing somewhere from somebody. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, uh, that's who Ron Marsh is. Ron, this is Joe Fugate, who is the uh, editor of Model Railroad Hobbyist, which how many years has that been going now? We started uh issue one was january 2009 so you're on your 11th you'll be coming up to your 12th year yes are yeah, you 
Joe, Joe won't won't remember this, but before the days of Model Railroad Hobbyist, uh, he used to hang out a little bit on uh, some forums from another Model Railroad magazine, and we used to actually interact a fair amount. And he helped me a lot without knowing it on the electronics and transitioning to DCC on my layout close to 20 years ago. Yeah. And and apparently, and apparently you made quite an impression on him. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I was the, I was the newbie at the time. So everybody, everybody turn your camera back on because I want to take a picture of all of us. Hang on a minute. Turn on your camera because we got to do. We got to do photos. I'm going to do a panoramic photo because I'm going to, I got several things going on here at once and I want everybody to see all the exciting action. Okay, perfect. All right, now we can turn our camera off. That's enough. Um, <laughs> enough of that. Uh, so, okay. So what was this, what was this forum you guys met on? Uh, well, it was the forums uh, connected to Model Railroader Magazine at trains.com back in the, <laughs> infancy of of their forums have you ever heard of that magazine uh, joe model railroad uh yeah a couple times okay all right new it's new to you is it it's a new kid on the block uh maybe <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah so anyways uh you got well and i had a i found a picture i had sent to joe quite some time ago it's uh when we were at uh jack burgess's house and we're sitting on a couch and it's, yeah. a, uh, yeah. it's you, me, and your wife, I think, isn't it? Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, and I we found that. So Joe and I go way back too, at least back to the to the forties. So okay, Joe. So how's life going with Model Railroad Hobbyists this year? Well, as you know, it's been a twenty twenty has been quite a year, and uh, when the pandemic hit, um, our sales tanked pretty steeply, about seventy five percent. So um, we had to do a number of things to kind of reorganize and make things, make it through. Uh, Happy to say that uh, we managed to do that. And uh, also it was helpful that we had things such as um, uh, the government's payroll uh, protection program, PPP. Um, Those things all helped. And we're actually in really great shape now and we'll start bringing some people back because we laid off most of the staff at that time um we're bringing some people back uh the other thing that was interesting though and sales have picked up pretty good so we'll see how the christmas holiday but i think people are kind of used to the fact that we've got lockdowns and and all of that now so um anyway uh the other thing that's been interesting though is all year long starting in march we have set records in terms of audience size so you know we've got our free magazine and we've got also some various free content and so we set new records for audience size and ordinarily the hobby is cyclical meaning that it uh, tapers off in the summer and then peaks in the fall and winter well, it stayed pretty much level all year long, mainly because people are locked down and they're bored, right? And they want to run to see something. And so um, in terms of total numbers, uh, we're doing great. It took a while for the, the sales flag, though, but it took a while, and those have started to come back. And so we're doing pretty good. We're in a pretty good place financially at this point. So um, I'm relieved to see that we... We made it over that big speed bump, and um, we're we're doing good again. So, and why do you th- why do you think that? So this is of your uh, your pay- you have a f- a free version, and then you have like a paid version of the magazine, right? Well, we have a paid magazine. We have uh, the MRH store where we sell videos and books. Right, and you can. You can get downloadable videos. You can buy DVDs. You can buy downloadable eBooks. You can also buy paperback books. Uh, and then we have our Train Masters TV uh, streaming site, which I call it Netflix or Hulu for model railroaders. Right. So it's a lot of uh, video stuff. I think there's a guy in there, uh, uh, Strang. Yeah. Some who's actually hosts some of those shows. He was great. He was great. And in fact, I need to talk to you about that. 
because I'll <laughs> talk about later, a little later on here when we get to talking about how the hobby is changing. I need to talk to you. So anyway, uh, the running extra magazine sales just tanked. The MRH store sales dropped way off. And the other thing that was uh, rather disconcerting is we got a whole bunch of people wanting to cancel their train master membership. Really? Yeah. And I think what happened is there was like this mild panic. Right. Uh, where, you know, people were not sure financially what was going to happen. So they were basically doing some belt tightening. We also had a number of people who said, I want to cancel my train master's membership because I no longer have a job. Okay. Which is understandable. Yeah. So, yeah. And how much, how much is the train masters per year? Um, well, it used to be, <laughs> it used to be, it was a uh, 45 99 per year. Right. But if you would, if you were an existing member, you could actually get a slight discount on that. Uh, we are dropping the price as of January, 2021 to 39 99 per year. Okay. And right now we've got a sale. It's 50% off. So it's like 20 some dollars. Uh, you know, it was a forty-five dollar price, so it's fifty percent of that. So whatever that is, twenty-two ninety-nine, I think. Right. So the uh, so now is the time to sign up then. Yes, if you want to sign up, boy, fifty percent off. Um, we also have a great deal going on running extra right now because running extra was started in November of twenty eighteen, and running extra is another hundred pages plus or minus of articles by really savvy modelers. And so it tends to be more, a little more advanced uh, articles and there's no ads. And the idea was we had all of these articles in our backlog and the free magazine is funded by advertising. So, you know, obviously we can't be stupid. What we need to do is we need, we can only print as many pages as the ads are paying for. Right. So the ads, uh, the pages that were being paid for bought by ads peaked in 2016 and it's gone downhill since, although that's kind of tapered off now and we're during the, as after the, as things are kind of settling out with the pandemic, we're actually getting a bunch of people coming wanting to advertise with us because one of the things I'm pointing out to people is there's never been a better time to advertise because our audience numbers are off the charts right now. Okay. Right. So, so we're getting some advertisers coming back as well as uh, uh, several new advertisers. Um, but anyway, uh, I can only do the pages that ads will pay for. And so we had a lot of articles in backlog. And so we're scratching our heads. How can we, you know, first of all, people were saying, uh, well, let's just move to a paid magazine. And I really didn't want to do that because the way, the way you market things on the internet is you have something that's a value that's free and then you can have other things that actually cost a little bit. So um, what we finally came up with is a second magazine called Running Extra. And it's kind of a clever name because anybody who understands prototype railroading knows that Running Extra is a prototype railroading term, right? So a little bit of a play on railroad terms there. But it's another 100 pages with no ads. So that gave us the ability to take all these articles that were just sitting on our backlog because we couldn't publish them quick enough because the magazine page count was constrained, the free one. And so in order to make running extra convenient for the people that did want to sign up for it is we also put the free MRH in the back. So basically okay. you, you don't have, you know, a bazillion downloads every month to try to get everything. You got one download running extra and it's got the hundred pages of ad-free articles in the front. And then it's got the Model Railroad Hobbyist free pages in the back. So the end result is you've got like this 300, 250 to 300 page magazine every month. Wow. And I did some computations. And if you print that thing out, you know, if we went to paper, people ask, why, why can't you do a paper version of the magazine? If we went to paper, that sucker would be over half an inch thick. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and, and it would cost, you know, also because of just in time printing economics, uh, you know, regular magazines, paper magazines underwrite the 
cover price on the ads. Okay. So we're printing a lot of pages in this magazine that isn't funded by ads. And so we couldn't underwrite the price very much. So the end result, dirt cheap, you'd be looking at 12 to $14 an issue. And then you'd have to pay postage. And by the time you pay postage, you're looking at about $20 a magazine. Yeah. So it's not real. The actual paper is not economical. So nobody pay that. No, no, exactly. So why, so I'm not, I, I'm going to say the word, I'll use the word surprise. I'm kind of surprised that your sales of the, of the magazine are uh, dropped off because like, I understand a lot of people were out of work and things like that, but you would think that the, you know, what is it? The nine, 20, basically 20 bucks a year for the magazine that, that wouldn't drop off, but I guess that's just one of the first things to to go. I guess people thought was their magazine subscription, and then pretty quickly, things started to turn around, and people were finding it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I I didn't talk much about price, but running extra is two ninety nine an issue, which you know what's a paper an eighty page? You know this is a two hundred and fifty plus page magazine, and it's two ninety nine. An issue, and so your typical hobby paper magazines right now are about eighty pages, of which about thirty to forty percent are ads, and so you know you're paying, and you're paying what seven, eight, nine dollars for a paper magazine, yeah, get eighty pages, and with us it's two ninety nine, that's full price, two ninety nine for two hundred fifty pages, <laughs> uh, and if you we have a deal right now where if you want to subscribe, it's twenty nine ninety nine, and you get all the back issues as well. Right. So that so that's um, what twenty five twenty six back issues. But you'll keep getting the back issues, you know, as long as you subscribe to renew. It'll be the regular nineteen ninety nine price. But the, basically, it's the nineteen ninety nine price for twelve issues, right. which is a nice discount uh and then for another 10 bucks you get all the back issues which is two years of back issues i figured it's about four thousand pages wow so for 29.99 you're getting by the time the the 12 months is up you'll get another thousand pages so you know you're you'll get five thousand pages of how to insight a lot of a pretty uh good expert savvy insight well, and i did the math and it works out it's like um 40 cents an issue or something like that. So that's just, I mean, that's nuts. Well, sure. And, uh, you know, like I'm just scrolling through the the December issue now while we're talking. And I mean, it's just a top quality magazine. I mean, it's never been, uh, Model Railroad Hobbyist has never been anything as far as I'm concerned, but top, top drawer, top quality. And I mean, that's a lot of work for you to have maintained that over the years and never missed a beat, really. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm surprised that the sales dropped off because, like, again, I, I understand people people lost their jobs and stuff. And they need to cut where they need to cut. But, but well, if you recall, back in March and April and even into May, there was a lot of uncertainty, just a lot of uncertainty, and people people didn't know if we were all going to be dead by the end of the year from this virus. You know, it's it's now proven that. Um, you know, it's not nearly as bad as everyone was afraid of. It's it's no cakewalk, but it certainly right. wasn't what it, what everybody was afraid it could be. Which, by the way, just a side note, um, COVID's now working its way through my family. Oh, really? Yes. Um, my granddaughter had it to expose all of us. Uh, we never really came down with it. Uh, but then my son, whose wife works in the hospital, she ended up getting it, bringing it home, and then he got it, and they're all over it now. But then my grandson, who lives with his folks right now, he's like, I think he's going to turn 20 in uh, a few days. Right. December, baby. Um, he he picked it up from a co-worker. Now he's got it. And it was interesting talking to my son because he said, he said it, it wasn't even like the worst flu he's ever had. He said, but it, the pro the problem was it just lasted a long time. He said I was laid out for seven days from it. Right. Uh, he said I'm over it now, 
Uh, my wife's over it. The kids were fine. It didn't really seem to affect them at all. So anyway, that's a little side note on the virus. I also know at least three people who've died from it. So, oh my goodness, it's it's not it's it can be bad. But those all the people I know who died from it was all back in March, April, May, back when we didn't really hadn't really figured out the treatments for it yet. So yeah. there's a lot a lot of treatments they can do now that kind of nips it in the bud. And of course, the vaccine's coming. So, and so when did the when did things start to pick up again? Uh, things the first real spike back was July. Okay, so things started to pick up, and then they've slowly been working their way back. And now here in the holiday season, we ran a Black Friday sale. Um, that was a great, great sale. Um, did five digits in in sales, which was a, really helped. Right. And then uh, now we're we're continuing to run holiday sales and the sales are pretty brisk at the moment. They're they're doing pretty well. That's good. So so anyway, financially I'm I'm pleased that the company's in a pretty good shape at this point. And uh, so I, I'm I'm hopeful for the future that uh, as we work our way on into spring that this sucker's gonna you know, the, the we'll have gotten through the worst of this winter and uh uh you know uh, there will be a slow building of immunity and and if we when we get to next winter hopefully it won't be nearly as bad so yeah and it must uh, it must uh you yeah. know it must not help the magazine that you couldn't get the shows or anything like that and expo- you know be you well, know that's get- yes yes that's the other wrinkle let's talk about that all right because let's, let's talk about as, that as of december just worked out this way as of December, we are out of studio segments. None, done, empty, and uh, we we can't uh, we can't get people to go to the studio anymore. First of all, the studio was in Canada, and they shut down the border. Right, well, that didn't help. And then getting to people to come in studio now is tricky. Uh, even even so, because I'm also uh, set up here in Portland to have people come, and we can shoot videos here as well um that's really difficult to do though so what I, what we've done and, and i had an article in um mrh a couple months ago i think it was october right what we've done is we are moving to uh, a new approach on doing virtual clinics and uh, also i'm encouraging people we're, we're resurrecting a series we had called my layout and the idea is to have people video their own layout and send in the footage, and then we will add commentary and stuff around it and uh, turn that into a layout story. And so we've we've gotten we've got a number of those my layout projects in flight. We've got one that's actually been submitted at this point. I do have two more layouts in the can still, so I will be running one of those this month. But then uh, come January burn up the other one and then i need to figure out how to get more layouts and uh, i was talking to some of the guys in the bay area because you know there's supposed to be an nmra convention in santa cruz next summer yeah i wonder i wonder if that's going to go now yeah i don't know so i was talking to some of the guys in the bay area about me coming down in january and shoot some layouts and i got kind of a lukewarm reception uh and um at least one of the guys I was talking to said, you know, uh, if you come, I want you to wear a mask. We all wear masks in the train room. And then he said, and actually, as I think about it, we can't maintain six foot social distance. The aisles are too narrow. So he said, I really don't want you coming. Right. So, so you know, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm getting. So people just don't want, you know, anybody coming into their basement right now or wherever their layout is. So, um, it's a bit challenging to to get get layout stories, but we we kicked off the virtual clinics. I did a, a series of three clinics with Rick Green, who is one of the hosts. Uh, I'm looking for more hosts to do virtual clinics. Lionel, yeah, hint, hint. <laughs> um, um, and uh, you know, if you're interested in that, we can certainly talk about it off. Off, you know, once once we're done talking here, well, but uh, how about we talk about it now? I'll I'll be happy to do it for you, and uh, 
I don't know whether you intended to pay your hosts or not, but I'll do a co- I'll do the first two or three for uh, for free just to get you going again. What the heck? Wow, that's that's great. Yes, yes, we play, pay the hosts, and we even pay an honorarium to guests too. So, well, you uh, won't, you won't pay me for that. How about this? I'll host the first four of them for nothing. You won't pay me because I want to help you get MRH keep going. Okay, okay, that's great. So, so here's what we did. What what I did is I did some research and found uh, a web camera, a high end web camera that also includes the ability to have an external mic and to uh, stick us one of those little mini smart cards in the camera and it'll record. Okay. Right. And and you can also get online with it, but that's not really the main thing. The main thing is you can set up the camera and you can have the lavalier mic still and you get this really nice pristine recording because you're recording straight through the, from the camera to a local card in the camera. So that's uh, this nice high-end webcam. Okay. Uh, and then what we do is we set up laptops and we get uh, Bluetooth earpieces and Bluetooth to the laptop. And then we start a, a web uh, call session with, you know, the host and the guest. And so we set up the laptops so that when you're on camera and you look over at the host, you're looking the direction where the host will be on the split screen. Okay. Right. right. And because you've got the earpiece in your ear, now remember you're using lab mics, so you're doing a local recording. Since you got the earpiece in your ear, you can hear what the other guy's saying, uh, and you can have a conversation. But the um, web web session on the laptop, the audio isn't polluting the audio that you're getting on the lavalier mic. Because if you if you actually had the audio on on the laptop, you're going to get an echo. Right. And it's not going to sound good. So we did that. And so Rick and I did that. I was the guinea pig. I was the guest. And the guest actually has two of these cameras. He's got one on a tripod looking over the desk. And then he's got another one that's on this gooseneck arm that's got a heavyweight base that he can bend over and put over the workspace. So you get this overhead view uh, of what's right. going on in the workspace. You know, right. So you can see that as well. So... And then um, that's so that's all set up. And Rick and I did that, and it worked great. Worked absolutely great. Got great recordings. And so we've actually put the first one up on Train Masters TV. I called it the new Backshop Clinic. The other thing I'm I was planning to do before the pandemic and everything, I was planning in January 2021 to do a major refresh of Train Masters TV. Change, uh, update the look, update the music. You know, just just update the whole look and feel of Train Masters TV uh, as far as the video content. So in essence, this is because we were running out of content. I actually started back in August building some new content for Train Masters TV so that we could stretch out the studio segments we still had recorded. And so what I did is I have a segment now that I'm running called Aha Moment. And basically, it's intended to be a really short, to-the-point uh, discussion about a certain little-known technique in the hobby. Okay. And, and uh, it's it's intended to be very meaty and not a lot of uh, wasted airtime. Okay. So basically, we get right to the point and then just uh, meet, 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 meet all the way through. There's there's It, it just moves. It, it moves very quickly. And so it's, a, it's intended to be a very high punch segment that you, it's short and to the point. And uh, so that's aha moment. And then I also started a series that um, is based on my books, make it run like a dream. And so it's basically me talking about track work, rolling stock and locomotives and all the things that you need to do to get things to run really well. And that's going to run probably for 40 or 50 segments by the time it's all done. There's just so much to talk about. And I'm going beyond what's in the books because, you know, there's always little nuances that you couldn't put in the book or the book would be 300 pages instead of 100 pages, right? So so a lot of the nuances, also a lot of examples on how to apply the techniques that are discussed in the books. 
Right. And then there's new things that keep coming up all the time. And so anything that's new that didn't make it into the book because it's something, uh, it's a new development in the hobby. So then I'm putting that in there too. So we have that series as well. So, and then uh, we're doing these new, these new uh, virtual clinics. We're going to a virtual back shop. Uh, Bob Fallowfield is going to do a virtual DCC decoded. And uh, yeah, we can, we can do, have you, uh, Lionel host uh, some back shops, or we could come up with your own segment. Mm, I'll, to, I'll host. I'm a host kind of kind of guy now. No, no, no. What I mean is, you can still host. Oh, but it'll be a segment where you're the host, and it's got a different name. All right. Okay. Sure, that'd be cool. Um. Yeah. So okay. So now that you've weathered this entire year, this uh, crazy. Have, do you have any questions, Ron? By the way, you've been pretty quiet. Well, I, I've just been soaking all this in. I, it's just a lot to lot to absorb so far. Yeah, a ton of uh, when Joe when when Joe gets going downhill, you you want to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so um, where do you think the the state of the hobby is? Because me personally, I'm sticking with my statement of social media is going to make this hobby just explode, and we're all going to be covered in model railroad goo, and. Uh, so now that you've weathered this storm, where do you think the hobby's at? Well, I think it's really interesting because the hobby's moving to the internet uh, like a, like the proverbial freight train. And, you know, there's been uh, virtual train shows, virtual, virtual uh, train meets, you know, with clinics uh, popping up like mushrooms all over the place. And uh, I think that's going to continue. And in fact, I see that supplementing in a big way the um the in face train shows and it might even impact the in face train shows and in fact i would argue that an in face train show if it's you know if it's got some uh some money behind it like the bigger shows like uh train fest uh the amherst show um let's see the nmra meet uh train show and and convention so if those those big shows like that, I I would argue that they need to be thinking about uh, to having an online segment to their show. And you know, I don't think people, you know, since this since it's a big official show, and you know, you'll pay a hundred dollars plus to register, and then you'll pay you know travel plus if you go all week travel and hotel, you know, you're looking at a thousand dollars plus to go to this thing for a week. You know, I think if they, you know, charge like $99 to to basically get uh, access to to all of the stuff, <clears throat> all the clinics, I mean, we're talking high profile clinics, and high profile guys, or even, you know, $49, whatever, pick a, pick a price. I think people would, you know, compared to the cost of going to the convention, to be able to take in a lot of what's available at the convention, you know, even have somebody walk around the train show and do interviews and, you know, and put that all up as part of this virtual attendee sort of thing. Right. I think these shows are missing it if they don't do that. Well, there's a, uh, I interviewed a fella, uh, Lauren James, who owns Otter Valley Railroad, which is a store uh, probably halfway between Toronto and Detroit. Yeah, on the on the Canadian side, and uh, about uh, I don't know, I interviewed him maybe a few weeks ago. It'll be in the spring when it's uh, the interview comes out. And he uh, one day in his store, a very successful store, he decided uh, with one of his uh, employees, they did a Facebook Live of around the store of products, and in forty five minutes, he sold six thousand dollars worth of product just by people ordering what he was showing them online on Facebook, like on right on, uh, you know, doing it live. And he was selling stuff that he'd had in the store for a while that wouldn't move. And, and, you know, he just connected with so many people around the world. I mean, that's what I, that's why I think this hobby has just been waiting for something like this to catapult it from where it's been to where it's going. Well, on the other flip side of all of that, the other aspect of all of that is that the young are the ones who are online before anybody else. 
And so if you want to reach the next generation, you need to be on the internet. Absolutely. And what's happened is this whole situation in 2020 has forced, is forcing the hobby to get online unlike it's ever got online before. Yeah, it's and, for, yeah, it's forcing it to move to the new whether you like it or not, you gotta you gotta get hip with the kids. And there are tons and tons of young people out there that never before had the opportunity to connect with each other. I just interviewed two guys, uh, John Caffarelli and Cam Neely. Uh, a couple of guys are 22, 23 years old, and they found each other on Facebook. And they live, you know, one's in Chicago, one's in Indianapolis. And uh, they found each other on Facebook and became great friends. And, I mean, that's what's happening is these, everybody is connecting with each other in a way that never before has ever even come close to. It's just, it's just the hobby's going to become cool. That's what's going to happen. It's going to become more mainstream, which going to, which is going to make it grow like crazy, and it'll just go from there. Well, the other, the interesting thing is, um, if you get on YouTube and start searching for videos that ha are basically people showing their their train goodies that they just bought you get a lot of videos of these very young sounding voices showing train sets that are running on the carpet and all of this sort of thing i mean there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these videos and once you get do a search and start to get into this group of videos that show the train sets in a very raw <laughs> state like this uh, different train goodies um you'll then be open, the door will open up, you know, because YouTube will recommend similar videos, right? And so then you'll just have video after video after video after video of young kids showing their train stuff to each other. And, and it, it, there's hundreds and hundreds of those videos on YouTube. And so, you know, there's somebody out there who likes these trains. And also, uh, you mentioned some young guys. I'm actually talking to some young guys on Facebook right now who are part of a a group that's uh, sort of trying to organize and, and reach other young modelers. And so we're having a conversation right now about what does the hobby need to do to really reach the new, the new, new newbie, you know, newbies. Right. And it can be older people as well as. Absolutely. Kids. And I'm pretty well, sure, I'm, I'm pretty sure what I knew, what, I know what your answer was, but I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, uh, Ron, do you know what he, uh, what his answer was? Uh, well, I was I was going to throw this in. I don't know if this answers your question exactly, but uh, I mean, the beauty of that whole thing is, in a lot of ways, it's it's far easier to to get in the hobby and begin to progress in the hobby now, maybe than ever before. I mean, when when I first got in the hobby, you know, almost thirty years ago, uh, if you didn't know how to do something, you either had to find somebody who knew how to do it, or you had to go buy the book, or happen to have the right copy of the right magazine that had the you know. And now it's literally at your fingertips and, you know, those, those new people, young and old, but, but kind of just focusing on the, the young ones for the moment, um, not a day goes by that I don't get at least one comment that starts, I'm brand new to the hobby and either I found this video or, Hey, I have, I have this question. I saw your video, but I have this question. Uh, it's constant. I mean, and I think the, I think the, the whole pandemic thing, Obviously, it, it's been difficult for those who have had financial loss or lost jobs, uh, but for those who have been able to be, be financial sta financially stable through it, but they find themselves there at home more, they can't get out, they can't do the things. It, it really, I think in a lot of ways, it has really opened doors for, for the growth of the hobby over the course of, of these past nine months. Yes. And in fact, I would say if, if you want to reach the next generation, and reach a lot of hobby newcomers, then the place you need to be is on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, yeah see, I agree. Neither one of you got the answer. I'm not all. sure what the question was. The, the <laughs> question, how do, how do p the young people connect with each other? How do new people find the hobby, you know, learn about the hobby? The answer is, and it's really obvious, it's really simple. <clears throat> they need to listen to a Modeler's Life podcast. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say that. It must be something with initials AML. Yeah, there you go. Um, and I think, too, I know both of you guys feel this way. I mean, we're very excited about what the pandemic has provided for the uh, model railroading. But I know that you two guys feel the same way I do, is that we wish none of this ever happened. And we and we 
feel bad that a lot of people have suffered greatly because while yes, model railroading has has benefited from this, we wish it never happened and we'd found another way forward. I know well, that's the certain truth. This, this is no fun. No fun at all. But yeah. make the best of it. Take the lemons and make lemonade. It, it's always nice to find the little bit of silver lining. It doesn't mean there wasn't a cloud. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, what do you think about... I'm I'm curious about your opinion about uh, the retail end of things and how the hobby's going because there's that store in in, in Longwood, Colorado that just completely went befunk. Kevin Rubel's store just went completely gefunk. Caboose, I guess, was the remnants of Caboose Hobbies. And and yet I know another guy, uh, Stephen Atwell, who runs Midwest Model Railroad in Independence, Missouri. And I mean, he's grown like a, a like a, a bad weed. He's gone from his basement to a 3,000-foot store to a 9,000-foot store. Like, what do you... I saw that Caboose advertised at the end of the What's Neat for December. Like, what do you know of that? Is that just the bad, is it a bad location or what's, what's happening with that? Uh, it's the location, but it, um, unfortunately it doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, the actual operation themselves. Uh, for instance, in Colorado, they are forbidden from letting people come in the store. So people actually come to the door every day to that store the doors are locked and they cannot let them in because it's against the law. Wow. So, I mean, that's a good way to run your business into the ground now, isn't it? Yeah. Where Missouri, they don't have the same level of lockdown. Oh. And, you know, so people can, can actually go and go into a store. So, you know, you can, it is what it is, right? You yeah. Know, and that's just, that's just the, the way it is. And, uh, so it's so, just, a, know, just a series of bad breaks for Kevin Rubel and things just yes. didn't go his way, basically. Right. I mean, what can you do when you can't even let customers come into your store and buy anything? Yeah. Even though they show up at your door every day. Yeah, exactly. That's too bad. Um, because I was there in summer of 2019. He seemed to be low on stock, too. But I think that's one of the things uh, Stephen Atwell or Midwest Model Railroad guys have told me is, you got to keep the stock up, and he seemed to be pretty low on stock. But I guess he ran into a, a bunch of problems, and hopefully he'll get all his creditors looked after and all that stuff. Um, okay, so uh, like I say, I saw he, he advertised it on on the on the, what what's neat, Ken Patterson. What's happening with him? Give us a, give us a couple of minutes of Ken Patterson. Uh, well, Ken's uh, continuing to to keep coming up with ideas for content for his What's Neat show. One of the things that uh, he he kind of, he started out with a lot of how-to content, and then he kind of migrated into a hobby news show sort of thing. And uh, people got kind of frustrated with the fact that he wasn't doing as much how-to content. So he's moving back to try to do more how-to content in his monthly show with us. Now, he's also got his weekly video podcast yeah uh, and that's still pretty much a what's new in the hobby this week kind of thing you know literally the what's neat this week uh show name and so he'll have various guests and he'll talk about various hobby things not a lot of how-to content mostly uh did you know this was available kind of stuff and you know just generally talking about the direction that the hobby is going I, I still say Ken should be uh, uh, simply known in the hobby as the dude. Uh, yeah. Just the yeah. dude. Like, I would like it in your, uh, I mean, just one month in the magazine, just that, rather than list him as Ken Patterson, just list him as the dude. I mean, if anybody in the hobby should be known as just the dude, it would be Ken. Well, you know, it's kind of funny because uh, in his latest show this month, somebody commented about how um, he, his, uh, he needed to get a haircut because he's looking kind of ratty. Well, um, it's a little difficult to get a haircut when the salons are closed. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, I would about, I would, I would have think that's about right, eh, Ron? I can imagine Canada salon. Yeah, I can imagine him in a salon. It's hard for me to imagine him cutting his own hair. Yeah, I know, but I, rather than go to a barber, I can imagine that Ken would go to a oh. salon. <laughs> yeah. Well, whatever, barber, barbers, uh, hair salon, you know, uh, whatever, all the all the same. There's a salon here in uh, the Walmart 
across the freeway here in Woodburn, and that's where I go. Well, uh, uh, here's a little tip for both of you guys. A little help for me, for my life, if you can help me get through life. If you ever see me in a salon, hit me in the head with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll, go to, All right. I'll go to a barber shop. Um, it's just the kind of guy I am. Uh, okay. Uh, I think, uh, so the hobby's growing, you're under control again. You got her all, uh, tucked away. Uh, you got going in the right direction. Anything else we need to cover? Uh, let's briefly talk about, uh, hobby tech stuff. Um, to me, the, the latest developments in sound decoders and, uh, things like the photo throttle have very much transformed the hobby for me. And, uh, I can literally now, um, Take the proto throttle, which uh, is a small handheld mock-up of a diesel cab station in a, inside of a, an actual diesel. So it's got a throttle with notches. It's got a horn lever. It's got a brake lever. It's got a, a reverser, forward and reverse, and uh, the ability to, to uh, control the lights, much more like a prototype locomotive. And so I can literally have a locomotive that's sitting on the track with a sound decoder. And it's sitting there idling, and uh, I have to release the brake, and then crank up the throttle, and the locomotive. When I when I notch up the throttle, the locomotive will sit there, but I can hear it revving up, the prime mover revving up, and then it'll slowly start to move down the track and pick up speed. And then if I if I want to bring it to a stop, I drop it to uh, idle, which is not zero, and then I start feathering the brake, which is just pulling the brake lever over and moving it back and forth till I can bring the locomotive to a stop right where I want to stop it. And uh, the feathering the brake thing is just awesome because that's what prototype railroaders do. You know, just having a brake function, a brake on a button, um, function button, you can't feather the brake like you can with the proto throttle. So it's <clears throat> it's amazing. I we, we had the Toma layout that we built on Trainmasters TV, and then we took that to various shows for a couple of years. And uh, while things are slow, I would take the proto throttle and a, a locomotive and some cars on the Toma layout, and I would, you know, switch that layout and run around. And I was having so much fun. I was having more fun than I'd have on my layout at home. It was just so fun. And so it's like, wow, this is this is so engaging, so much fun. And uh, so yeah, now that I'm building Siski Line Two, and I'm building it in modular pieces sections. It's the Toma, the one module approach. That's a whole another podcast. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, but anyway, I don't. I'm not sure I'm going to need a lot of layout because with the proto throttle and the ability to simulate these locomotives down to just very realistically. Uh, it's so engaging. I'm having more fun than ever in the hobby. I'm more excited about the hobby and having more fun in the hobby than I ever have. Uh, the proto throttle was uh, the idea, the brainchild of Scott Thornton from Ames, Iowa. He models the uh, interstate railroad, the Milan uh, subdivision or division or whatever you call it, Scott, uh, of uh, the interstate, uh, Iowa interstate railroad. And the two guys that own Iowa... Uh, Iowa Scale Engineering, right? ISE. Iowa Scale right. Engineering are uh, Michael Peterson and Nathan Holmes, and they're a couple of awesome guys and uh, really, really good guys. They actually had a problem with uh, Caboose and Kevin Rubel, so I hope those guys... Kevin, you got to pay your bills, buddy. Um, uh, so anyways, uh, those guys have developed this thing, which I think, what you said, I think you... Uh, uh, you can build a layout that's two feet by six feet. And with one of these proto throttles, it can keep you occupied for hours on end. And I mean, yeah, it's just one and of the, oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of the best, one of the best uh, things ever to come into the hobby. And, and I will mention too, there's a steam version being developed in Australia. Yeah. The guy that's uh, working on it. Yeah. I think his name is uh, Mark Stafford. Come on, Mark, hurry up. Get the pitter-patter, buddy. Get her done. Uh, and it's going to simulate steam locomotive physics and uh, the whole shebang. So uh, there's so much that technology is going to make available in this decade. 
in terms of uh, taking the hobby to a whole new level of engagement and fun. And yeah, I think there, we haven't seen anything yet. I'm looking through this December issue of MRH, the free version. And uh, and then you've got a hundred pages in the running extra. Do you ever sleep? <laughs> well, well, this month in MRH, I actually wrote the cover story. Uh, most months, I don't write much other than an editorial, and there's a couple of really shorty uh, two-page spread that are in uh, running extra. But everybody else writes and does the rest. So you know. Uh, we we have brought some new staff back on. Uh, actually, uh, James Regeer, who's uh, one of Ken Patterson's buddies, is actually doing a lot of the editing on the magazine now. So, so it basically frees me up to do other things. I'm working on a lot of Train Masters TV videos at this point. All right. Uh, what, Ron, got any more questions? I, I don't think so off the top of my head. Where was this well worth your trouble? You've been pretty quiet, Ron. I'm always worried when you're quiet. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning stuff, man. I'm just soaking it in tonight. Uh, it's Ron of Ron Strange and Things. Uh, Ron Marsh, YouTube sensation. Ron Strange and Things. Ron is actually the official videographer of the AML Network. So that's why we're always uh, got Ron hanging around the studio. Um, uh, once again, Joe, uh, keep up the good work. Uh, keep at it. Man, oh man! Every year we do this, and there seems to always be something to talk about. Yes, there always is. Always. I think this hobby's going to grow like absolute crazy. I just, I see it every. It seems like I see it every month. It's just like I have completely lost control of the podcast, trying to figure out who to interview next. And I mean, we keep finding other young guys and other young guys to interview, and. Man, I think this, I, I, I wish I was younger because I think in 30 years, this hobby is going to be something nobody ever imagined. Well, like I said, we have set all time records in terms of total audience in 2020. Do you care to share some of those numbers with us or is that uh, inside info? Uh, we are looking at, I think the, the high water mark for any one given month is, I don't remember the exact number. But it's in the upper ninety thousands per month. Wow! Wow! Yeah. So the free magazine has been downloaded ninety thousand times. Not necessarily, because you can also read it online. Okay. And at least forty percent of our audience reads it online only. So ninety thousand okay. is the number of uh, visits to the website. That's the number of unique visits to the website in a month, and according to the uh, official. Uh, IAM or something. Anyway, they say that the way you measure an e-zine audience is you measure the unique hits to a website, to the website in a month, and then you dedupe that because you can have one guy who's you know looking at it on his cell phone, looking at it on his laptop, looking at it on his tablet. He's looking at it at work, and so um, there is a process where you do a survey. And find out how many, you know, get a, a basic factor that you can use to dedupe with. And so that's what we've done. So, and Ron, you and I have often had uh, uh, chats, not online, but we've often had chats about deduping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do you come up with a name like deduping? Well, you got you got to dupe in order to dedupe. So yeah, <laughs> first of the dedupers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> All the duplicates, you know, because you want to get down to the actual unique heads, right? Oh, uh, duplicates. Okay. Yeah. So, so if one guy, you know, is looking using five devices to look at the magazine, we we don't want to count that as five people. We want to count it as you know one head. So we're trying to get to the number of heads from the device visits. Pretty cool. Very cool. Well, Ron, what do you think, buddy? We've chewed up, uh, we chewed up almost an hour. I was going to try to keep this to 30 minutes and we've chewed up an hour because well, there's so, so much happening and it's been such a crazy year uh, in so many ways, but, uh, but some interesting and some exciting things happen in the hobby. We just uh, had to talk about. It. Yeah. What a, yep. what a, what a, what a ride. Okay. Um, the other, the only thing I forgot to mention is if you want me to, uh, 
to uh, host some of these videos. And like I said, I'm happy to do a, a few, the first few for uh, gratis. Uh, what is the what do, what, law, what do lawyers say? What's the word lawyers use when they do it for free? Pro bono. Pro bono. Yeah, I'll do the first few for pro bono. But I will need my own trailer uh, because I need I need time to motivate myself to get into the right frame of mind to be on camera. Well, since we're talking video, I can make you a nice trailer. <laughs> hey, I know what I want in return for hosting your videos. There you go. This is easy. Uh, I want to be able to plug my uh, podcast when I'm hosting your videos. Okay. All right. Boom. Done. See how I did that, Ron? Yeah, I saw that. That's slick right there. Yeah, that was slick right there, man. <laughs> all right. Uh, we have a, all right, uh, uh, Joe, thank you very much. But we have a job for you. Now, I know you listen to all the podcasts and many of them twice. But uh, what we need you to do is that the appropriate moment when I say uh, go, we need you to say happy rails to you with. No, that's not it. We need you to say <laughs> we need you to say uh, uh, subway chime go with a lot of enthusiasm. Subway chime. Go. Go. Subway yeah. chime. Go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So are you ready? Are, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Do it. Subway chime. Go. Hey, Gordy. How are you? I'm all right. All right. Guess what we're going to do now? I don't know what we're going to do now. Guess what? I've already t hit the button, buddy. 10 seconds ago. We're going to talk about something really important. Uh, cool. you, like, you like how I do that? It's like I jump right into it. Yeah, I feel, I feel like something profound is about to be said. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I just jump right into it. I set the, I set the old uh, wheels in motion. I hit the button and we start recording. I, uh, Johnny Carson used to do that. He would never talk to his guests before the show. You... Yeah, well, well, who needs the green room? I mean, it's, it stinks in there. Yeah. Do we even know who Johnny... You must know who Johnny Carson is, eh? Uh, where's some Google? <laughs> you don't know who Johnny Carson is? Well, that's cool. That just shows your age. That's good. How old are you exactly? 33. 33. Do you have ID to prove that? <sighs> Somewhere, officer. Okay. <laughs> Uh, license and registration. License and registration. <laughs> so, Gordy, every year at the end of the year, I do this thing called the State of the Union, and you are on a you're going to be on a show that was uh, also has Joe Fugate on it, and you're the last oh, wow. part. It's Joe's first, and then you. You're the you're oh, the wow. uh, bring in the you always say the big band to last, the best act to last. And oh, 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 yeah, it's, I feel like a bookend already. No, nah, not a bookend. You're like, uh, what was the last concert you were ever at? Uh, can't remember, but I get it. It's like it's like the last act. It's like closing out the show. It's cool. Yeah, exactly. You're like uh, Bono or or uh, Phil Collins or uh, who's the biggest? Who's the biggest? Who who did you listen to as a uh, as a teenager? Which was only. Which was in the early 2000s. Not that long ago, and I can't really remember. It was in the early 2000s. Uh, you know what? I never, I've never really been that heavily into kind of listening to listening to music and stuff like that. I Honestly, just... I know it's terrible. I'm like person. I'm like the weirdest kid ever because I was never watching. I was never watching TV or anything like that. I was never um, listening to music. I was just working on train stuff with my dad <laughs> so if we weren't watching the rugby we'd be watching like 1950s train videos and my dad would be like oh yeah look that locomotive was different from that locomotive we need to include that detail in the next kit and it's like i guess it'd be kind of like growing up with jason schron or um or yeah. shane wilson from scale trains and rapido i think that would be like that was my upbringing <laughs> so it's kind of but not time for music you know <laughs> um and where did you grow up exactly uh, just outside Manchester in England, which is uh, in the middle of England, and where? near Liver not not far from Liverpool. And and then you moved to Scotland somehow. Yeah, and then in 2015, uh, a friend of mine, um, who um, I'd met through work anyway, had uh, asked me to come and work for his company up in Scotland. And I was looking to relocate up to Scotland, and uh, so that's why I ended up in Scotland. Okay, so you've been in Scotland now for five years. Yeah, but yeah. In fact, it is on the thirty first of this year of of December this year of twenty twenty. It'll be exactly five years. Wow! And you moved up on New Year's Eve. Yeah, <laughs> the van hire was cheap. <laughs> you know what? Uh, and for there was a stretch there 
When I first met you, I thought, oh, a good young guy. It's fun to know you. I don't Where did we first meet? Or in Orlando. Orlando, yeah. What year was that? 2016 or 15? 2017. Was it? 17, 2017, yeah. Yeah, when I first met you, I thought, oh, good young guy. I really like him, blah, blah, blah. Then for a while there, you were kind of annoying. And now I've gone full circle back to you're a good guy, and I'm really excited to know you. But it's like you're hard to keep up with. You're too... You got to remember when you're talking to me that I'm on, you know, a slower speed or something. I I, I try. <laughs> <laughs> I try. You just uh, you are. You know what I need to say to people is what I've discovered about you is you are the real deal. Uh, Gordy is the real deal about when it comes to life and everything. He's just he is. When you might you might be kind of going oh, what, and then I'm telling you. This guy's the real deal. It's hard to, very hard to describe, but you're, uh, you're, uh, well, no, you're what, you're what you represent. What I like about the millennial generation. I think there's a lot of great people in their thirties, twenties and thirties and all that, that are really, really good people. And you represent that to me, but because you're millennials, it's kind of, there's always that stretch in there where you're kind of going, is this guy just a useless lump of poop or is he actually going to be uh, contributing and you're like a huge uh i'm very, i'm a huge gordy fan now that's my problem i'm like a, <laughs> i'm like a fanboy of gordy <laughs> <laughs> i don't know <laughs> well, I, I didn't know i had griefy but i'll take it <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly so okay so i wanted you on here because uh the state of the hobby i mean don't you think in the last here's what i said to um Joe, and I said it to Otto, who's on tomorrow night with Dave on the Patreon channel, and uh, tomorrow morning, I guess. And uh, here's what I said to, uh, to I rem- specifically to Otto. I, th- I said, I hate um, what this last year has been. We wish none of this crap had happened with the COVID and all that. And there's been so much uh, unhappiness associated with it. But on the other hand, as far as model railroading goes, don't you think this has been one of the most uh exciting years of all time for model railroading uh without i mean yeah without a shadow of a doubt for a year that a year when really our hobby and our you know the organization in our hobby that's very close to my heart has effectively been on life support because a major part of what we do as hobbyists which is enjoy the hobby together has been fundamentally changed probably forever um you know the the organization the, the hobby you would think has been on life support however flip side of that of course is it's a hobby that you can quite easily do when locked in your house as long as the the ups guy keeps turning up with stuff <laughs> yeah. so um it's I, I, may it's like been a volcanic eruption of model railroading and we, the, the model railroading goo has just got spread absolutely everywhere it's so exciting to be in the hobby and everything that's going on this year and we've turned such a corner of some of the challenges that we've faced for years and not really tackled have, have we found ways to overcome them with new technology and adoption of new technology and all these older people who I was always told by other older people would never use Zoom, would never use this, would never watch YouTube videos, would never turn up to a virtual meeting, would never share how to make something without being doing it in person, wouldn't even be able to operate someone's layout without doing it in person. And all of that has just got blown out the water. And it's so exciting. Now, don't you think there's like way more people under the age of 40 in the hobby than we ever realized? Like, well, I, I kind of knew quite a few, but yeah, um, I well, think more I, than some people realized. Yeah, like, I, well, like, okay, for me, though, I think, like, I, I'm always amazed at how big this hobby is. I mean, that's what the podcast has taught me is this hobby is way bigger than anybody realizes. But part of that is, uh, you know, there's always, you know, hand wringing about, oh, my God, the hobby's dying and all that. But we all start, pretty much all of us started at the same age, under the age of 10. There's others that have start, gotten into scale model railroading at different ages. But primarily, uh, even the girls in the hobby, uh, you know, were probably uh, exposed to it through their dads or brothers or whatever. And mm-hmm. don't you think, like right now, it seems to me like not only is the hobby blowing up, but part of that reason is all the people under the age of 40 can find each other um yeah and and more importantly can um the the community is is there they can find the community it's not just finding each other it's it's building and building a community and being able to feel um engaged and part of a part of the hobby no matter where you are and i mean 
think of all the friends you've got or people that you know now or that you've seen or stuff that you've been exposed to in the last year they're not they're not in your own town mostly they're not even in your own state and that that's that's the biggest difference and that um we we have to harness that and embrace it we also have to acknowledge that um there are a lot of people in the hobby and there are a lot of people at different different levels of engagement in the hobby. It's like there's there's thousands of people around the world, probably millions of people around the world play soccer. Some of them are in the premier, you know, the premier football leagues, the MLS. Some of them have a kickabout on a Sunday for their local pub team. Well, that's a British thing, I guess, but they do it. Some of them just go and play football with their kids. And that's the same with model railroading. You've got the people that scratch build everything. You've got the people that um, have a railroad prototype modelers you've got people who just have a four by eight layout that's just a green painted board and you have the people that the that the, that the train set comes out once a year and goes on the carpet and runs around the christmas tree and you know what they're all part of the same community and that, that, that we all we should embrace all of them but i reckon this year there is more people as a whole part of that community now in december than there was in january and that is a fantastic thing and and if the, the the best thing that people can do to grow the hobby is not tell someone to join the NMRA, although obviously I'd like that. But it's it's to buy someone a buy buy pe- buy members of your family a train set. <laughs> you know, if you didn't get someone a train set for Christmas, then get them one for the to get them one at the next opportunity. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And and I you know I use the same analogy that you used for soccer. I use it with hockey. I'm, I'm like, sure, there's a, a bunch of guys in the NHL, but you've got millions of guys playing the game at all different levels and they're all hockey players they all love the game and that's exactly where we are now and i think i think because of what's happened the hobby is going to become more mainstream the hobby isn't going to be recognized just as model railroading i think it's going to become more mainstream because it's going to become more acceptable that you don't have to have any size of a particular layout you can just love the hobby and the community and that's why you're in it Oh, absolutely. And and the more people see other people engaged in the hobby, the more acceptable it becomes. And and I I mean, you look at the level of stuff that's being produced by the manufacturers. Um, I just don't think they can keep up with demand anymore. And we've seen that this year. And it's not just because COVID. It's it's, it's too easy to blame the pandemic on on uh, fluctuations in in uh, availability of stuff. That's rubbish. The fluctuations in avail- availability of stuff is because more people are buying it. More people are buying it because there's more people getting in back into the hobby or getting into the hobby for the first time or expanding what they do in the hobby. That's why you, there's stuff running out of stock all over the world. It's I, I, I watch what goes on and I, I saw today that an Australian model shop put on that they've got five boxes of flex track delivered. I mean, when did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've never seen them on the model shop say we've had five boxes of track delivered. And literally two minutes later, they'd sold all five boxes over Facebook. I mean, like, honestly, and you're telling me the hobby's dying? Go and have a word with yourself. <laughs> Go and have a word with yourself. <laughs> well, and I thought the way I the way I see it is I feel like the hobby, because of, you know how I feel about social media and the hobby, and I feel like the hobby had started to accelerate before COVID uh, became a reality. And I thought the hobby had already started to accelerate, but then because of this unfortunate incident with COVID, all of a sudden the, 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 the mechanism was already there. And it just, like you said, like it was like a volcano went off. And by the time, you know, the end of May rolled around, end of May, 2020, you could just feel this crazy excitement about the hobby and like i say i think it's going to become more mainstream even yeah you know, i think Abs- it's oh yeah yeah absolutely and it has been doing in in europe and and other parts of the world outside of north america it's becoming it's been becoming more mainstream for a very long time but um you go and look at menards in america and you know because i because you know i've traveled to america extensively and i keep abreast of what's going on around the world um in in the hobby um and 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 then just let's just look at America. You've got Menards, basically a homeware shop, doing its own line of model railroad equipment, structures. And it's not its structures, it's track, it's locomotives, it's rolling stock. It's not just one scale, it's two scales. I mean, come on. Yeah. Come on. These are not these are not businesses that don't invest where they don't see a market opportunity. So um 
yeah, I think it's I think it's great, and I think it is mainstream. I don't think it's becoming more mainstream. I think it is a mainstream hobby now. I think um, it's a fully acceptable hobby. No one's scared to really say to anyone anymore, "I'm a model railroader," because as soon as they put it on Facebook, um, one of their neighbours will find them, like what happened to me earlier this year, and 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 um, and go, "Hey, I, I I've got my old, I've got my dad's trains, or I've got my trains from when I was a kid. I, I always wanted to get them back out." and They'll, they'll get them back out, decide that the after and stuff from 40 years ago maybe isn't what it what it was. <laughs> I've been sitting in a box for 30 years and, and but they'll nip off down to their local hobby shop and buy new trains and they'll they'll re engage with the hobby. So Well and part of that all, all the better for it. Well and part of that too is when you say from thirty years ago. Like I can remember forty years ago I bought my first Atlas Cato Drive locomotive and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. It ran so well and I'd never seen anything run that well so this is the uh, early 1980s and i mean so people now who are 45 their train set came from that era when a lot of stuff already ran decent so they're being ex- and now yeah. the stuff they're seeing coming out of the out of manufacturers is just spectacular and i was going to make a really good point i wonder what it was can't remember now i don't know doesn't matter um it'll, boy, it'll come back to you. Can, 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 I, wouldn't it be great if this is actually like a professional show? I mean, well, that... if you look at the script, we just refer to the script that we wrote earlier, and you'll be fine. Um, um, all right, so let's bring everybody up to date on the life of Gordy. Um, you became a director for the NMRA about uh, so today is December. I think today is December the twenty seventh. So you became a director. For the NMRA, when? In the end of November, middle of November? Uh, middle middle of November, yeah. Wow, that's gone fast. Yeah, middle of November. Today's December the 28th. Um, 28th, yeah, yeah. yeah. Middle, middle of November it was. Yeah, so like almost six weeks ago. So what's that experience been like? Has it been uh, uh, as what you expected? Has it been a negative? Where, where are you at on that? uh it's been what i expected um but it's been the gaudy standard gaudy experience so uh one has um dived into this with both feet and uh and so has is now involved in a committee of the board looking at um working with the lcc team to support them uh grow the adoption of their uh standards and and their technology um but there was a lot of work to set that up we've been involved in all setting that up and getting that going and that kicks off in january uh from a position where that wasn't very good been attending a few board meetings and providing a few uh perspectives from a younger person i suppose is the best way to look at it and to question certain things that we're doing and whether we're actually seeking problems or whether we're trying to find problems that fit fit proposed solutions rather than finding solutions to problems that really exist and that's kind of been a bit different from the board, but I tell you what, everyone's been really accepting. Uh, listened, uh, listened, shared their views with me. Listened to my perspective. Um, no, actually, it's been a it's been a very very nice experience with working with the board and and uh, getting stuck in for the benefit of model railroaders and, and the same model railroaders, not members, because ultimately, the everything the NMRA does, every every model railroad in the world benefits from it. It's just that the members uh, of the NMRA help to make it what it is for everyone else so it's it's great so then basically so what you're saying what i'm hearing is uh while maybe the boards some of the board's ideas are somewhat antiquated they've been they've been accepting of your enthusiasm and your desire to make the nmra a better place uh yeah and i think you're gonna see some significant changes from mm-hmm. the boards okay. with the conversations that are going on at board level. i can't tell you what's i can't get into that obviously but um well, you, can there, t- there are... you, you can tell me because there's nobody listening. <laughs> there's nobody listening. <laughs> no, the, 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 in, in all seriousness, the things that people have said and been saying for a long time have 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 been heard and and are being looked at with fresh eyes. Um, and and a lot of that's been being driven by, um, to be fair, Mike Arnold, uh, who's the lead director, and and myself and and a few of us. Um, you know, we, we're just driving to make sure that we are. Um, looking at things through 2020 vision rather than see what I did there through 2020 vision yeah. rather than you know maybe 20 you know maybe 1999 vision so um, the world has changed we need to accept that that means that everything's back on the table to be looked at and reviewed as far as I'm concerned 
and, and, and it's just a case of working with board members to, to see it from that perspective. Of course, if you've been on the board for 20 years, um, as some, some people have been on the board for 20 years, um, you've seen a lot, you've done a lot, you've probably looked at something before and you've, you've argued a point and you've fought for a position and you've probably put that behind you, you know, once a decision was made and, and reopening cans of worms, so to speak, is, is always a difficult thing, but then the world never stops turning. So we should never stop looking back. But one of the cool things that we're going to be working to do, or I'm working to do, not we, uh, me, um, for NMREX is to start surveying members because I really want to make sure we listen to the voice of members and non-members and bring that into what we do. So as NMREX is currently a free program of the NMRA for members and non-members benefit, uh, we'll be putting out an electronic survey um, probably in January to uh, to all the to all the viewers of NMREX and the non-viewers to ask what you like, what you don't like, what would you like to see different, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and then we'll be making sure we loop that feedback into what we do. I was talking to Dave Abelizer when we were uh, interviewing uh, Otto Vondrak, editor of RMC, which is <laughs> tomorrow. And he was talking about how he felt like the initial surge of people viewing stuff has kind of gone away and the, the novelty's kind of worn off. Have you guys seen any of that or you feel like it's still well worthwhile with the NMRX? I, I think it's still well worth our while. I think what's happened is, and I, I can't believe I'm saying this, I'm so proud that I'm saying this, people have caught up to what the NMRA has been doing and have started putting on their own events. And some of those events have possibly a little bit more financial backing than ours. Some of those events are a bit more targeted, a bit more niche, like the uh, railroad prototype modelers. And they are um, starting to to kind of dilute the, the appetite for it. I think the appetite's still there. Um, I think we're going to wind back to being more of a regular cadence of what we do and how we do it. And we're going to see where we go. We're still pulling in over well, thousands of views. I mean, thousands of views. Um, so it's still being watched by people. Whether it's being consumed live or being consumed after the fact, is, a, is, a, is more of it's being consumed on demand, which is what you would expect. That's the way the world is now. But no, we, we've not seen a significant change in numbers since from March to now. What we have seen is that the NMRA's YouTube channel had less than a thousand hours of stuff viewed. I think it was a hundred or two hundred hours of stuff viewed in 2019, and in 20, uh, 2020, uh, when I last checked, it was about two hundred and eighty-five thousand hours of stuff had been viewed. Wow! So that's a lot. That people that's like huge. people like YouTube. What? What's the deal with YouTube? I mean, I know we have a very popular podcast here, and people really like listening to it, and they listen to it when they're working on their layouts or driving truckers like John McManaman or David McRae or other guys are listening to it while they're heading down the, the two lane or uh, got Brian Beek out there and other farmers, uh, Josh Bowman, that are listening to it while they're working on their farms and stuff. So what is the what's the what's what is the draw of YouTube, do you think? I think the draw of YouTube is that there's just so much content on there that you can literally pick and choose what you want. I mean, you look at, <laughs> you can't compare it to cable TV because you can literally pick and choose. And there's a video, a niche video for anything you can think of is going to be on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, me and Anna, me and Annabelle, my daughter, in a morning before I take her to her childminder and, and drop um, drop my wife wife to be off at uh, work, we we sit and watch rail fan videos. And we watch rail fan videos of the railroad that we are going to be building in a, in model form. And, you know, she she loves it. Absolutely loves it. She waves at the engineer. She's not quite worked out yet that they're waving at the cameraman and not waving <laughs> at her, but she loves waving at them as they go past and, and, and saying hi and stuff. And, and um, you know, that I can't get that on, on cable TV. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, that's that's the pull of YouTube. It, it's, it's kind of people try to do this whole... Uh, back in the 90s and, and mostly in America and then it used to you know, there used to be shows in the UK that used to really really uh, rip it apart uh, where people used to have their own TV and you could go and rent a TV studio for an hour and make whatever you wanted and it would go out on public <laughs> public TV to everyone um, kind of YouTube has taken that idea and done it properly and, and people you know the content you look at Ron's Ron's trains and things I mean fantastic content for beginners and and established modelers I mean you're not, you know, you're not paying for that. You should be supporting the channels so that they can produce better content. But that's what the pull of YouTube is, Lionel. It's it's there. And and like in industry now, 
people are using YouTube. We use YouTube in my industry and software to go and research how to use new technologies. It literally is becoming the world's video encyclopedia. Yeah. It's, it's great. Um, Ron Strange and thinks he's the your official videographer of the AML network. And uh, you're right. He has a great channel and it's a high quality stuff. It's all very high quality videos. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things. Hi, I'm Ron of Ron's Trains and Things, and if you'd like to see more Model Railroad tips, tools, and techniques, then be sure to subscribe down below and click that little bell icon so you can catch future video. Um, yeah, but you, then you look at you look at Drew. Look at look at what look at what our new young 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 gun is doing, and and um, Drew Drew Warrington's stuff, fantastic. He's getting into that, and, and it's not, he's learning so much about yeah. the hobby, about himself about what his capabilities are, about how to produce quality videos. And he's still in the hobby. He's well in the community. He's he's not trying to achieve his MMR, but he is contributing to the community. And that is so, so important that he he's con- encouraged to continue to contribute in his way to the community. And that's what's so good about YouTube and social media and everything that's going on in the world of model railroading at the moment. That's what I, that's a, a, a subject I'd like to explore even more someday is, like, what do you think the the community of like model the, the community of model railroading is something special, and like I think that's what's really taken a hold here now is just this camaraderie that people have with each other through with the with the main with the the glue being the hobby uh, model railroading, but yet they're building this massive community. Like, does the NMRA? talk about that at all? Like, when when you're do they do they have a sense of that's their most prized possession is the community um i think we do know that the community well when we talk about community the nmra membership current membership community is our biggest asset i think we do know that i think um there's on obvious conversations about how do we ensure that we are connected to the wider community because there are there are a dismal number of nmra members it's eighteen thousand nmra members right there are 50, 65, sorry, 65,000 members of the HO Scale Model Railroading Group on Facebook. Right. So it's more than three times the number of NMRA members worldwide in one Facebook group. And, and, and so we have a huge problem to stay relevant in the hobby. Now, it's never, ever in our history been a case that every Model Railroad has been a member of the NMRA, not even close. But when we're hovering around less than 1%, we have to – the NMRA seriously has to sit back and look at it, or should be seriously sitting back and looking at itself. And and trust me, that's my intention from whatever position I, I have within the organization, even no position at all, is to keep campaigning for the voice of average model railroaders and for us not to lose sight of the people that are important to us as a model railroaders member or not a member. Although, of course, we, we value our members and we, we look after and nurture and support the needs of our members. Of course we do. But the but the most important people to us are model railroaders. And and we, have, as an organization, was always set up to campaign and re- represent the rights of model railroaders, the right to have stuff work with other, other people, manufacturers' stuff, to have it work together, to, have, and to, to ultimately in, ensure people enjoy the hobby. Because if it didn't, work together you wouldn't you wouldn't keep doing it all right so i mean uh, it's like okay along those lines on, sorry, no no you i cut you off i apologize gordon sorry i apologize i cut you sorry. off I it's mean, okay go and ask your questions <laughs> <laughs> you know what uh so i'm a, <laughs> so just so everybody knows i'm assuming because you're a member of the nmra board but you do live in great britain I'm assuming you probably live one through uh, close to one of the major cities like Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, no, Edinburgh is um, nearly 300 miles away. Oh, so you live in a fairly large city, though. And uh, no, no, um, no. I, I live on a three and a half square mile island with 400 residents, uh, with the North Sea on one side and the North Atlantic on the other. And that's what is so cool about the new world of the NMRA and the new world of model railroad. This hobby is going to explode. As I don't think it's still. I don't think we've still got to the exploding part. I think we're still at the at the rumbling the of the, uh, the the kind of the eruptions bubbling up. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. I think oh. so too. It's like it's like. I'm, let's just put this into perspective. I'm a British guy. 
living on a little island, connected to the world and, and being an active, very active part of the running of a multi-million dollar global, you know, not-for-profit organization for the hobby, connected, very well connected with the membership across the world. And I'm building an N-scale model railroad of a, of, of a part of Wisconsin that I have visited twice <laughs> in my lifetime that runs a railroad that, that's that's operated by a railroad company owned and operated from canada <laughs> and, and and i i find everything that i need to do that and to learn about that and to research that either by contacting people through the internet or finding information on the internet or, or you know or, or, or from the manufacturers and, and, and purchasing of equipment that's mostly manufactured in china shipped to america and then shipped from america to me or canada to me and it's mental in that mental and and that's when you sit there and you think about it it doesn't matter whether you live on a tiny little island in orkney in scotland in the middle of the, it doesn't matter whether you live in the middle of new york city well it probably does because if you lived in the middle of new york city unless you were very very rich you're not gonna have much room for that basement empire but um you know it, it doesn't matter where you are you you can contribute a lot um, no, no one's got an excuse to not contribute exactly <laughs> Do you think the uh, NMR? All right, let's get down to brass tacks first. Be, like, just quickly, <laughs> no, just quickly explain to everybody what LCC is because we talked. We you just brushed over that. Oh, so, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, you should be sorry. That's a good idea. I am, you know what? Every me. time is every time. Yeah, I'm talking. You should just say you're sorry. Um, don't be I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, yeah, say you're sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what exactly is LCC in in uh, in the very short ver- uh, version of it? The very short version of it is it is a new way, a new set of standards to help you um, control the complex um, systems that you would have to control the layout, whether that be uh, block detection, signaling, turnouts, illumination, um, everything on your model railroad that is electrical that is not contained within the locomotives or rolling stock is LC. It can is part of LCC, and it's a um, it's a, a set of standards that were developed over the last ten years by the NMRA and the Open LCB Group um, to help manufacturers develop that next system of kind of like it's not DCC for for your, for your layout. It's it's in the next step beyond DCC, but it's the same similar concept that stuff will all work together and help you control your big your big railroad and i tell you if if the world moves towards remote operations or hybrid approach where some of your operators are not in the room which means guys and girls that maximizes how much layout you can have because you can get away with having those two foot wide aisles that me and lionel don't fit down um then you know that's what lcc is all about it's because because think about when i was a kid and i'm not that old but when i was a kid i used to operate a layout that was 400 feet long it was all DCC block and it was all, you know, signaling and everything. It did have solenoid uh, turnout motors, but it was a fully signaled layout and everything. There was miles and miles of wiring. It was really, really complex. I wouldn't like to try to recreate that layout with there's so many commands and signals and instructions and everything, bits of data going around a model railroad, of even a small model railroad, that um, it's it's huge because People now are putting sound and lighting effects under the under the railroad. Miles Hales layout in Kansas City has um, that's Miles Hales MMR has a um, stockyard under it with where the cows go moo and stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, LCC would allow you to to operate that layout and make it uh, make it run so the cows only came on when you potentially were standing there. So it's not absolutely deafening in your train room and stuff like that. The the the, the, the it's off the chart the scale of it. You know, look at how far DCC's come. I was listening to the interview with Nick's Trains um, a few weeks ago. And, um, you know, y- your first decoders, as Kaylee Whiteroo points out, the first DCC decoders had two functions on them, um, you know. Uh, and, and and now they've got tens of functions on them. It's the same with LCC. The layouts are becoming more complicated. We need a control system that can scale with that. And that's what LCC. How did how did I sound on that and Nick say uh, that Nick's Trains interview? How was I? totally confused <laughs> yeah there's that to it too yeah <laughs> but 
But so let's not scare everybody away. LCC isn't something people will have to use. It'll be there at a, for for those who choose to use it. You're, the NMRA is setting up standards for those that choose to use it. Absolutely. It's just like you don't need to use DCC sound. You don't need to use all those lighting functions. You don't need to use DCC at all to enjoy the hobby. Right. And 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 so it's 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 all about making sure that when it's all about making sure that we try to work to reduce the frustrations of model railroaders when they get to a point that they need that technology, they get to that scale or that complexity level of complexity, and uh, we help them overcome it. That's the that's what the NMRA has done since 1935. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, the, the, the technology around the hobby gets more complicated. So the, so the standards and the technology that we're working with gets more complicated. And oh boy, LCC on the face is complicated. But DCC on the face is complicated as well. If you're, if you're fresh coming into the hobby nowadays and you go DCC ready, DC, DCC non-sound, DCC sound, it, it's, it's overwhelming. It's, it can be very quickly. It's, However, yeah, and it's the same with any new technology. But however, future. DCC can be very easy to hook up. It doesn't need to be complex, but that's another story altogether. Um, is there ever any time on the on the podcast, all the podcasts you listen to? Seriously, is there any time that I don't sound confused? Um, not really. Um, I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's a challenge. To, yeah, yeah. It's just a uh, it's just perpetual confusion on my part. All right, let's get right down to brass tacks now. Here's the reason we're talking. Uh, on uh, December 28th, uh, it's soon going to be January, and in the next couple of weeks, uh, we got to get as many people as we can signed up to the NMRA and get ready, because on January 15th, what's going to happen from the NMRA headquarters? Uh, so what will happen is our uh, board of director and officers of the NMRA national uh, elections will commence and will run until March one. Uh, and so all the ballots will drop into people's electronic mailboxes um, for members in the United States. And there'll be different setups for regions outside of the United States you'll be informed of. Um, but yet you'll be getting a ballot and you'll have the opportunity to vote for um, the members of the board of directors and the officers, the president, the vice president and the secretary of the uh, NMRA. So it's a big change. There's a lot of, lot of positions up this year. And are you running for any particular position? Uh, yeah, so you'll see Gordy on the uh, on the ballot. Uh, I'm running for NMA president. Um, wouldn't it, is, it wouldn't it be cool. cool if on the ballot it just said Gordy, not your last name? It just was like just Gordy. Well, just like that. What, like, what do you need? Like share, right? It's just Gordy. Yeah, you know, yeah, or like you're the modeler, simply known as Kelly. You're the modeler, simply known as Gordy. Yeah, essentially the president, simply known as Gordy. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> So, uh, uh, are you excited about the possibility of being president of the NMRA? Absolutely, um, I'm really excited. I think I'm 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 really really excited about the opportunity to um, enhance what the NMRA does. I don't want to. I've spoken the podcast before. I'm not a person that wants to make sweeping changes and take away people's things. That's not me. That's not what I want to do. But I, I do think that um, the operational. Uh, the way the organization currently operates or the tools the operate or the organization currently uses to operate need to be modernized. And I think ultimately it needs that younger person at the helm to, to drive through those changes. If, you know, if there's other people on the ballot who've been on the board for 20 years, why, why haven't things, why are things not better than that with them already being on the board? What difference is it going to make now after 20 years, you know, and, and it's, it, 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 I have a lot of experience. I might be only 33, but I've been in a lot of senior management roles um, and, and held a lot of responsibility in my career. I, you know, I went went into the world of work at 16 and, and I've worked very hard um, and I would do the same thing for, for the NMRA. So yeah, I'm really excited. I think it's a great opportunity. I think it would be different as well to have somebody from outside of North America um, have a different take on it. You've still got the board. It's still not one person. You know, it's about relationships and networking and, and reaching compromise. But I think the people who work for the NMRA, not the board of directors, not the, not the officers, the people that, that make the stuff happen at the grassroots level, in the marketing department, in the social media team, in the headquarters, in the IT team, they 
are crying out to modernize what they do and and if we can modernize what we do and change the way that we do certain things or improve the way that we can do certain things then it will help the organization scale as much as the hobby is at the moment the organization isn't really built for scale in its current guise and and it isn't going to scale it just is not going to scale now you're talking in uh in uh, buzzwords what do you mean it's not built for scale mean it's not going to grow oh okay I mean, it's not going to grow without fundamental fundamental changes. You know, you should be in a position, we should be in a position in 2021 where um, a member signs up online and they're instantly getting a digital membership card. They're instantly receiving the benefits of what they signed up for. It shouldn't require some kind of manual operation in an office. Um, we, we should have... Um, we we should be offering programs to engage with people who are not attending face-to-face meetings and stuff like that. And that's got to come from national and the regions and divisions should be better supported with infrastructure. There's no reason why. And I know there's lots of money at different regions have money and stuff in their own right, that are their own corporations and, and stuff, but we should be, able to scale to have it resource and i'm going to not use the word scale we should be able to have it resources for example that would mean that a region could host its its website for and, and communicate with its members using the national tools we need to do there's a little bit of that goes on but we need to do so much more and we just need to get down to being we need to get the organization back down to being a friendly and supportive organization for model railroaders that's extremely welcoming from the grassroots, from the from the shop floor up, and and I see the good that's done on a day to day basis in the shop floor. I've been lucky enough to visit probably fifty percent of the regions of the NMRA as a member, and I have always been made welcome. I get that there's sometimes it's not as welcoming as it could be. I also get that people turn up, try the NMRA, and don't see the return on the investment, don't get what they expect, and, and that we've got to look at that and we've got to understand why. We should be asking people why they leave we should be putting things in place to you know to help them not leave one of the biggest reasons people leave the enema is they forget to they forget to renew why do we not give an auto renewal membership there's just so many things lionel that are small simple things to fix and we would be a totally different organization and that's what i really want the opportunity to do and anyone who's been on the board for 20 years and not done those things just does not just doesn't have an excuse but there's but there's some very very good people going to be on the ballot there's some very very good people stepping forward for our organization who, who want to see it drive drive itself forward and they're coming from that, that grassroots level and i think it's a huge change it's not they're not coming from people that have had held other director positions and they're just moving seats so they can sit on the board for another six years it's people there's a lot of people on these ballots that are coming up from the grassroots and that's what we need different complete change not complete change. That's the wrong thing to say. Just, just uh, uh, some different voices. Yeah, you know, need, the new voices. Some fresh good. voice. And uh, what is your why? Uh, why are you so devoted to the NMRI? Do you can you can you put your finger on something uh, on a reason why you've ended up being so devoted to the NMRA? Because I don't think I've met anybody that's as devoted to it as you are for many many years and. I just don't like what were you did your dad expose to you at a very very early age or what do you think it is no no so my dad um my dad was very good he taught me a lot about the industry and of model railroad manufacturing um but he was always very protective of his models and he, he was not the kind of father that taught me how to do things and he was not the kind of father that would let me touch the models and, and break things and stuff like that. Damage was a big deal. I used to read read the railway reference library in our family home with white gloves on because he didn't want the books damaged. It was very strict. Um, but what happened is his friend, who was um, an NMRA member, took me to the NMRA division and showed me these North American trains. And a bit biased, my dad didn't really care for North American trains. He was into his British stuff. He didn't care whether I broke it or not. Um, but he, he would he would ha- support me. And that group, uh, that NMRA division in the UK, was so welcoming to a, 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 I was about 13, 14 at this time, so welcoming to me. Unfortunately, they never told me what the NMRA was, otherwise I might have got a life membership. But they um, they, <laughs> they they never asked me to, to join the NMRA. They, I paid my, my way. It, they produced it. They created a discounted... Uh, appearance fee to turn up to their monthly meetings for me so i could take part at a price that they knew i could afford i think it was like 50 pence or something like that 
and and I could take part. They would make sure I had a time slot on the layout so I could run my trains. Um, they would help me. They would advise me. They would encourage me. Some of them would give me some models to go away and do. And that was a fantastic experience. If it wasn't for that experience, I would not be modeling what I do today. I probably wouldn't be as engaged in the hobby as I am today. And, and I just want to make sure that the organization is getting back to that grassroots level of encouraging novice modelers and modelers of all, well, models of all ability to improve their enjoyment of the hobby and, and, and to be doing that in a supportive way. And, and that's why I am so, I see that that is what the organization sets out to do. That is what the organization aims to do. Maybe not everybody in the organization does it as well as others. I admit that's, that's just life. But that's why I, that's why I am so passionate about the organization because I know that if every model railroader could have that same level of of, nur- of nurturing and encouragement that I got in those formative couple of years when I was a teenager or just getting into the hobby, let's say, because we have this whole youth policy thing, but just getting into the hobby, um, then the world would be a better place and that the the hobby would be a better place for it. So hats off to these guys who took a young 13-year-old guy and with open arms welcomed him into the hobby and now and and fueled your enthusiasm for the organization. Hats off to those guys. They didn't realize what they were doing, but they were they were they were making somebody become a lifelong supporter of the NMRA and hopefully uh eventually the president of the NMRA. Absolutely. And when I, and, and I stepped away from that probably in about 2002 because I went into the military in, in September 2003. But when I came back into the NMRA in 2014 and went back to, to go to NMRA meetings, they recognized me. I mustn't have changed that much. I, I, I can't remember having a beard when I was 13, but anyway. And and they um, they recognized me and they all came up to me and, and asked me how I was. And it was just like I'd never been away. And I, honestly, Lionel, that is the grassroots of the NMRA. That is genuinely... The, the majority of people involved in the NMRA and that is genuinely what they want for the hobby and for people getting people in the hobby that's community and that's what we've probably lost a little bit of sight of and we need to regain that and improve it um i wonder what it is about the community of model railroading because it seems like it's a very very tight-knit group of people that really desperately more than anything want to be friends with each other and i mean i stick by my story that i've said Many many times, you could uh, you could have a guy that's a, a, a world class brain surgeon in Boston, and a guy that's a computer guy and living on an island in the North Atlantic off the coast of Scotland. And if they find a common ground in in the hobby, they will become lifelong friends. Absolutely, and and that's what's so great about our hobby. The the greatness of our hobby is the diversity of of what could be classed as being involved in model railroading. It's it's such a diverse range of skills that we acquire or need to acquire to, to really master the hobby that we always, you know, we we always have to learn from someone or somewhere. No one's born with all those skills, just no one is. Uh, some people are very good and naturally gifted, but there's, you know, not no one can be naturally gifted at every single aspect of model railroading. And that's why the community is so important to the hobby. Because you have always got something you can pass to someone else and someone else has always got something they can pass to you. And and that's where you can sit down and find that common ground. And you you might be struggling to solve that problem that you've been trying to solve. And hey, Mr. Brain Surgeon has the answer to that. But then Mr. Brain Surgeon's problem that is a simple problem to you to fix, you have the problem you have the answer for him. And, and that's that's our hobby. That's what's great about it. It's not like going you know, crashing planes into the ground, <laughs> going doing model aircraft and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's it's just not. And and the thing is as well, you can you can put that kit aside, and as I'm sure many of the many of the AML listers have, um, you can put that kit aside for 30 years and procrastinate about picking it up again because you made a little mistake or there's a bit on it that you've not done very well or that you're stuck on how to do and you're scared of doing it. You sit it on that shelf for 30 years, you can pull it back off the shelf because someone gave you the answer you were looking for or the, the knowledge you were seeking, and you could carry on with it. I mean, there's not many other hobbies that you can get away with that. Do you have any sense if of... if you sit... I'm sorry, oh, I cut you off again. Go ahead. No, no. I'm so sorry. I, I'm sorry. so sorry. I was just going to say that if you don't <laughs> if you don't lace up your skates after 30 years, I can tell you, you'll have lost a, lost a lot of skill. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I can still put on the blades. I can still. I still got a. I still got a decent wrist shot. That was mine. I was a defenseman, and I had a pretty decent wrist shot from the right hand side. Um. Uh, <laughs> I knocked the guy. I knocked the goalie's mask off with it once. Um. Uh, do you have any sense at all of how big this hobby is in relation to other hobbies? I do in the UK. I can give you some facts from the UK because I guess that's home waters for me. Um, the second most popular non-sporting male hobby um, is uh, model railroading in the UK. Okay. After fishing, fishing is the number one hobby. Okay. All um, right. And 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 that was done by a, a survey not that long ago. Um, I, it's on mainstream TV in the UK. I mean, for crying out loud. Yeah. Um, exactly, and, and 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 that then took people from buying train sets to going to train shows with their families, buying train sets, and then realizing there was all this scenery material, and they're actually now making layouts. I mean, like it's 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 the the, the families are still there now. The families have always been at the train shows, but, and you still see them now. But now you see them going out with more armfuls of stuff <laughs> than I've ever seen before in my mm, life. Yeah, well, and uh, I've never seen anything like it. So yeah, I think the hobby's huge. Um, I, I, is there any chance that the NMRA could start some sort of a department where we could have learned, uh, where we could all help Chris Adams with his scenery? I don't think Chris Adams needs any help with his scenery. Well, he, you're talking to him. He needs all kinds of help with his scenery. You'll, you, oh, by, sure now, that... by now you've heard the Christmas show and the whole, the half of the Christmas show was taken up with, uh, uh, trying to convince Chris Adams and he knew how to do scenery. And he's like, he's, he's scared of doing scenery. And it's like, he does beautiful scenery. Right. I've seen his layout in person, and he is fibbing. He is going to grow a you, Chris. You're going to grow a Pinocchio nose if you don't cut that out. <laughs> but, but having said having said that, there is always something new to learn in the hobby. I remember you you said to me a few years ago. You said, "Gordy, Gordy, you, you come into Springfield. You've absolutely got to go to see George Sellius's layout." And I was like, oh, I've seen photographs of it. Oh, if we can't get make it, it'll be fine. If you know, I'm like, yeah, it's on the list of things to do, but we have other things to do that day. If we can't make it, it'll be all right. Yeah, don't worry about it if we miss it. And you know, the thing I picked up from George's layout was that I'd never considered before was where are all the birds on everybody's layouts? Wow. Where, where are all the birds on everybody's layout? Because George has all those birds on top of all of his structures in various, and they're not all in the same pose either. And he also obviously has the bird crap all over his roofs. And it's like, some people have the bird crap, but where are all the birds on yeah. people's layouts? Look at how many pictures. Go and look at the whatever model railroading magazine you've got nearest to hand. Flick through the pictures, and your one thing you'll miss is birds. And it was like, oh my, wow, it just clicked in my head. So I, on a day I was not expecting to pick up anything new other than, of course, seeing a fantastic layout. I'm not knocking that layout. That layout is, is in the top top 0.0001% of model railroad. So if it was like a book of model railroaders, you have to model railroad layouts you have to see before you die, it would be well in there. Um, but it's fantastic. But that was the thing that I picked up from it. So there's, so it does not matter. Every time you step into a basement or you step into a train show or you step into a room with model railroaders, you can always learn something. So I have no doubt that someone somewhere has some tip, trick, skill or, or, or thing to teach Chris about his scenery. However, I would say Chris has a very good bag of ammunition of things he could teach me. So, you know. So you were you were at uh, Chris's house. Did you see trains running? I did an obsession at, at Chris's yeah. and I had had a few beers when I did it. I, I, <laughs> I've never. I, I've been, I, I've been, I managed to operate his layout. It was very good. <laughs> I've been to Chris's house. I have yet to see a train up, uh, actually move. So it's all very Oh, strange. no, we had, a, yeah. we had a full-on AML, AML Springfield obsession. And Rod Dreary was there from from Australia. Um, there wasn't a grader for him to drive, unfortunately, so he had to settle for a for a, a, a ten wheeler. But I think he enjoyed that. Um, my I brought somebody over from Scotland with me to the. To, this was this year in 2020. The only train show that I've managed to go to all yeah. year was Springfield. I am the luckiest model railroader <laughs> in the UK, I think, other than my other friend who managed to go with me. And um, anyway, yeah, we did operate trains at Chris's. Yes, Gordy had been drinking a little bit in the afternoon because um, it was my day off. We weren't at a train show or anything like that. So we'd been enjoying ourselves a little bit in the afternoon. And it was a difficult layout to operate. And it was a difficult layout to operate after having a beer. But uh, <laughs> it was a fun, fun layout to operate. And I had a, I had a job where I had to cross the four-track New Haven main line. Imagine doing that 
when you can't really see where you're going. But it was good. Um, it was really good fun. Chris was a fantastic host, and that layout, it's going to take him forever to finish it because he's going to such a high standard. But, oh, beautiful credit layout. to him. It's fantastic. Beautiful. All right. Uh, in the last minute here, so how do we vote for Gordy? What's going to happen? So... So yeah, if you're an NMRA member in the uh, in North America, you should receive an e ballot, um, which you will get through your email. So you should look out for that, and you will be able to see the candidate statements for all the candidates, and you'll be able to choose um, who you would wish who you wish to vote for for each position. Um, also, people can send in mail in ballots. Um, uh, f- there'll be a form somewhere on the NMRA website to download a ballot form, but it'll also be with the NMRA magazine if you receive it. Um, uh, if you're in uh, the UK, it's a paper ballot, so we need you to post those paper ballots back or email those paper ballots back. It's not a kind of fancy tick box thing like it is in America. Um, if you're in Australia, I believe it's an e-ballot system that they use. So, um, you know, if you're in Australia, if you're in Australia, you'll, you'll do that. And the thing to remember as well is that certain board positions are only open um, if you live in that area the district of that director post. So for example, if it's Eastern United States or Eastern North America director, sorry, can't forget Canada and Mexico. If it's Eastern North America or West North Western district, North America, or it's North America at large or large, only people who live in that area um, of North America can vote equally. If it's Pacific district director, which is up, I think, yeah, it's, that's one of the ones on the ballot. Um, then only folks in Australia and New Zealand can vote for that. Um, and obviously president though, vice president, every single NMRA member needs to vote and, and share their uh, view of, of how that goes uh, for the next three years for the organization. Um, so everyone can vote for that position. So don't just, the other thing to do is don't not vote for a, a particular officer or position because your vote still counts just because it's some it's in an area or you feel it doesn't affect you because all of these positions, all board members and all officers of the NMRA represent the whole organization as a whole it just doesn't matter where they technically reside they there's not constituencies um or wards they they literally represent the whole organization and make decisions for all of us so it's really important vote for gordy that's all you got to remember vote for gordy <laughs> well it would be, don't it be would embarrassed be very don't much be, appreciated don't be embarrassed that's what we got to that's what we want people to do we want to vote for gordy and we're going to have young blood in the, at the head of the NMRA, and we're going to en- end up enjoying the hobby even more if we all vote for Gordy. Uh, however, we do. Anybody else who wants to come on the podcast, and uh, any other candidates who want to come on the podcast, just uh, send an email to the podcast, and we'll get you on, and you can say your piece. And when do the votes have to be in by? The end of February. It will say on the ballot exactly what date is set. I don't know at this point what date is going to be set, but it'll be around. Uh, be around. They'll be out for at least a month, to six, uh, four to six weeks. They'll be out for. Are you excited? It'll be different in each each region. Are you excited? I'm really excited. Whole... Yeah. Okay. That's I'm really cool. excited. I think it's a. I think it's great. Our democracy is great, and uh, people getting involved with the future of the organization is even better. So here's a key question for you, depending on which way my vote would go. Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs or Boston Bruins? Careful with your answer. So I'm not going to lie because I, I believe that if you don't live in an area where the team is, you should support the team in the area where you live. None of those teams are in the area where I live. There are no NHL teams in the UK, unfortunately. So in that case, it should be the first team that you see live <laughs> at their home venue, which means that would be Boston Bruins. And so I have to say Bruins. Uh, but I stick by that. I always stick by that. And to balance that, I I bought. I have always bought Alex Toronto Maple Leaf stuff. So it's right. very balanced in our house. Okay. okay. So, right. and Alex is your wife. Um, yes. All right. Cool. Uh, do you know what to say? Now we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next segment. Do you know what it is you have to say? Is there something coming after this? Yeah, there's something coming after this. Yeah, we have a we're a multifaceted show. We're off to the next station then, so no. subway chime, go. Yeah, let's say a little more, uh, a little more. Uh, more gusto. You never like how much. It, you know, it's half past. You know, half past twelve at night. You know, what you should go is vote for Gordy. Subway chime, go. I like that. Yeah. Do it with some gusto. Okay. okay. Vote Gordy. Subway chime, go. <clears throat> okay, uh, Dave. Yes. What'd you think? Great. Podca- podcast 
gold. Podcast gold. Podcasting gold. A- another one for the, for the for the uh, for the archives. Yeah, another one for. The, I'm looking forward to be if Gordy becomes president. Well, even if he doesn't, he'll still be director at large. We uh, the AML network has access to the uh, NMRA board, and we can have him on and ask questions and. But I mean, man, when he gets rolling there and the passion that he has and everything, yeah, and it was fun listening to Joe too. I mean, Joe's uh, was telling us about when COVID hit, he almost had to close the magazine down, but he got it rolling again. So that's cool. And uh, then Gordy comes along and he's just like, uh, I told him he's like the last act. He's like, uh, you know, when Aerosmith was on, Joe was the opening act and he was the, the, the main the show, the headliner. Yeah. It mm-hmm. was great. And I appreciate I appreciate you sticking around for the whole show. I thought you, I thought maybe backstage you were having a couple too many beers, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> Do you drink beer? Uh, occasionally. If you were drinking beer, uh, you know what? Let me ask you this question, Dave. Yes. We don't live that far apart. We are mm-hmm. we're like a six, seven, eight hour drive apart. Right. Uh, once the COVID thing is over, we will see, we had already met several times in the, f- the past and we we will spend more, many more times together in the future. Uh, and I don't think it came up in the past, but <clears throat> just on the off chance, you and I are doing something. We're at some train event. We're at NERPUM. We're at the AML barbecue. We're at a regional convention. We're somewhere. And I turn to you and I say, Hey Dave, you want a beer? <laughs> and you and you say so you know you're like yeah let's have a beer i said well you know what i'll go down i'll go down to the store and i'll get us a six pack now and i'll say well let me give you half we'll split it yeah and i'll be like and you'll say oh no and i'll be like no no i've got it either you will give me the money for the entire case of beer or i right. will pay for the entire case of beer because we're pals right pals don't make pals pay for beer correct it's just not the way it's done. And the other thing to remember is if we did buy beer, when we got back on the bus, we wouldn't hide it from everybody else. Correct. <laughs> We'd buy more beer so everybody could enjoy it. Right. <clears throat> um, all right. So we got that show done. Uh, we've done all of our, after this, we've done all our work. Uh, the t- tomorrow's show is uh, Dave Abley's. And Otto Vondrak discussing the state of the hobby, and it's great. That's the Patreon show tomorrow, and okay. it's great as looking always. That What's that? So I'm looking forward to that one too. Yep, Uncle Dave is always great, and Otto is very insightful and exciting. And well, I'm not sure I would uh, exciting is the word. Otto's insightful, thoughtful, it's fun to talk. Fun to talk to. I'm not sure I'd say exciting. Enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. Otto is extremely enthusiastic. And he's doing a great job as editor of uh, Model Railroad Craftsman. Yeah, Railroad Model Craftsman. Or Railroad Model Craftsman. And we did have a discussion about the whole rail fan railroad thing about, you know, one month it's rail fan rail, and railroad, and uh, next one it's railroad. Still can't, still can't sell them on that, huh? Nah, nah. Mm-hmm. But it's still, uh, it's been tabled, so it's not gone. What else do we want to talk about? What is? Did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? Always, because <laughs> the list is short. So what is your uh, attitude between Christmas and New Year's? Because to me, it's always kind of like a week off. Oh, it's definitely a week off. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's like, it's not that I don't look to- forward towards Christmas. I mean, we have a lot more fun because uh, we have uh, Peter and Kyle here. So we've kind of gotten to the point where it's about those guys. And this year we, uh, we played Monopoly because uh, there's nothing else to do and, and there was the big storm at Christmas, which was crazy. Uh, we had a lot of snow from that. Uh, you probably got to use your new snow. But when is it coming, the new snowblower? Second week of January. All right. It's the quickest I could get it. Well, sure. Your Home Depot? Yeah, but it's, it comes right from the factory. Yeah. And, uh, is, it, uh, is it one with tracks or is it one with wheels? or was uh, it- I, I opted for wheels. I, I have considerable hill here and i felt that tires and chains would be better than tracks i I felt that the tracks you you know you you really can't do anything you know to to improve their 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 stiction and you know if if it slides on the hill i've got no 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 recourse this way i can 
always add weight or chain. Stiction. I've never heard of stiction. Stiction, yeah. That's <laughs> is that a word? Uh it is now. <laughs> <laughs> I was always amazed. Uh speaking of chains, and this is as good a time as any because it's Christmas time. Uh I was always amazed at our buddy uh Stuart Sterling because he drove UPS from Anchorage, Alaska, halfway to Fairbanks. And the stories, he, and he, there would always be pictures. He was always posting pictures of him chaining up the truck. Right, putting tire chains on. Yeah. There, you, there, is, there is nothing better for traction than tire chains. And, and you wouldn't think, I could never really imagine that you would chain up a tractor trailer because of the weight you would think you'd have plenty of traction. But he said, you know, out there in the middle of nowhere, if it started to snow without uh, without the chains, he says you could easily get like three quarters of the way up a hill, and that would be all she wrote, right? Because he's loaded. So, um, so yeah, so he was always pitching, putting. I've never my uh, when I was a kid, my dad wanted land. We moved from Toronto to uh, outside Toronto, thirty miles outside of Toronto. He bought some acreage. And he bought himself a John Deere tractor. Nothing runs like a deer. And uh, he put on a snowblower. <laughs> and that's was 19. This is the, the mid. This is the late 60s. So there's no canopies. There's no nothing. There's just you know your tractor and your blower on the front of it. And I can. My dad would look like a Frosty the Snowman by the time he was done. <laughs> I got to tell a great story. I got to tell a great story that I thought of the other day. Uh, about uh, mailboxes. <laughs> because on my in front of my house, the, oftentimes they will plow around the corner and then plow onto my lawn and pull up, you know, a good five feet of my lawn, which is really annoying. So you put stakes out and then sometimes they'll knock that down. So when we lived out in the country, the main highway plow would come down the highway. Are we doing the intro or the outro now? I forget. Outro. Okay. <laughs> Try to keep up. Uh, At least you're awake. This is going to sound really good. Um, So anyways, uh, the plows back then, they had the big wing plow. They would knock the post, uh, people's uh, mailboxes off the posts on purpose. Well, (laughs) they claimed it wasn't on purpose, but the guy's got the big wing plow. And we were in an area that got a lot of snow. So he'd, he'd extend the wing plow and he'd just pick off these uh, mailbox. It's just like, you know, just like bowling pins. And he'd be going I, I, I've seen places in, in snow country where the, 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 the post for the, uh, mailbox is probably 10 feet in and there's a big long arm that extends out, but it, it swings. And so even if they hit it, it just sort of moves out of the way and then comes back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, based on my personality, can you imagine that my dad was kind of a rebel? Uh, had to come from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so my dad puts up with this for about three winters. He was kind of a guy that wanted his place to look good. And he always had a, a nice mailbox. And then at the end of the year, oh, it would be nothing but a crumpled pop can looking thing. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> he'd paint it in his favorite hockey team or something. So one, after about three or four years of this, my dad had just about enough. So somehow... He managed to find a piece of steel pipe where the steel was about a quarter of an inch thick Mm -hmm. and it was maybe eight inches in diameter. Right. And it was about 10 or 12 feet long. And one summer he digs down, he gets the farmer across the road. They dig the post hole. They put in this steel pipe that's quarter inch steel, eight, six to eight inches around. And he fills it with cement. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> puts his uh, builds it up uh, you know puts a wooden thing on there puts the mailbox on there and he says to me and, 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 and under his breath he says there now let's see him hit that <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough first big uh first or second big snore storm out there we're sitting at the kitchen table on a saturday eating or we had been snowed in and all of a sudden you hear this tremendous Clang, <laughs> the steel on steel clang, bang, and my dad was like he never even he just says we we're sitting there eating. I can never forget we're sitting there eating, and my dad goes, "Got him." <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> we get up, and there's a guy standing there, and a the wing plow is like 
you know, flopping in the wind because it broke everything, every all every piece of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my mailbox, <clears throat> it, it from the plow has become unattached from the base, so it's just it's just gravity just sort of holds it there. Not, so the the post is there, but the the mailbox itself just sits on the on the arm. And this past snowstorm, um, my wife was like, well, where's the mailbox? I said, that's in the front seat of my car. She goes, well, what's it doing there? I said, well, I'm tired of retrieving it out of the neighbor's front yard because as they come by and the spray of snow smacks it in, it knocks it down the hill 20 feet. And I'm tired of going down there to fish it out. So now when it snows, I take it and I put it in the front seat of the car. And uh, how do all those uh, Erie Lackawanna Historical Society memberships get to you? A day later, <laughs> <laughs> but they come to your right to they're mailed right to your house. They come right to my house. Oh, okay, so I'm going to join the place just so I know where you live. Um, I think you live at 328 Chauncey Lane, something like that. 1344 South Main Street. Oh, okay. Uh, I think uh, Uncle Dave lives on Main Street. All right, that's it. Okay, so now we got to give out uh, our email address. Dave, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. For those of us who would like, to, for, for those of you who would like to contact us via email, the email address is modelerslife at gmail dot com. That's modeler with one L, like Lackawanna, not two L's, like Valley. Wow, I like that one. I was thinking of, uh, I was thinking of uh, one L, like mailbox, <laughs> okay. mm-hmm. and I just couldn't come up with the second one. But I like that Lackawanna and Valley. Very good. And we have a website, amodelerslife.com. If you go to that website, you will find all sorts of things about upcoming shows, shows that have passed, a crew page, uh, a couple of clinics in there, a page about all kinds of railroad terms. There's all sorts of stuff on there. And uh, if you uh, uh, want to get some swag, some merchandise, some AML swag, you just go to Midwest Model Railroad which is MidwestModelRR.com, and they have a page on their website dedicated to AML merchandise. And there is a cornucopia, a vast a vast room of all sorts of AML swag. There are T-shirts. There are hoodies. There are mugs. There are hats. There should be other stuff, but we haven't got it there yet. But that's four things right there you can buy. I need to uh, I need to go there and order a coffee mug. Okay, you don't have one? No, not yet. All right, I'm a little behind. Okay, um, I think that's it. I think we caught everything covered. We told a little story. We've extended the podcast. Everybody's having Mike Wachowski's happy. He's got a smile on his face. Little Mike, take a picture wherever you are at the end of this uh, podcast. He's still a uh, super fan thirty one, but it's still being. Uh, uh, considered by the board, so oh. it's, so we save that number for him. So if uh, he if it's agreed that he is a super fan, thirty one is his number. But it's still uh, he's basically a proby. He's our only super fan that's a proby. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Did you see that picture that uh, Rod uh, Diary did? Like the book? Yeah. Uh, no, I did not. He uh, got a license plate for his uh, um, recreational vehicle, a trailer. Okay. A beautiful new trailer he bought. And the license plate on it, AML space SF space 38. Nice. AML Superfan 38. Very nice, Rod. Nice job, buddy. Well done. Well done. If you weren't a super fan, you would be now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. That's it. Are you ready, David? Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> So remember, remember, a Modeler's Life podcast is considered marginally adequate by six out of ten railroad, model railroad factory representatives. Uh, Guys that just bought brand new snowblowers and dishwashers. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Snowblower operators. Yeah, snowblower operators.
now it's time for the New Jersey Transit Elevator Escalator Report. Take it away, Dave. Good morning, everybody. Today, uh, number one here on the list is Nork Penn Station, number 14. Uh, that one needs a step chain adjustment. they got to adjust the lower carriage assembly. Nork Penn Station, number eight, is back in service. Secaucus 16 was out overnight for a, a skirt panel reset, but he's back in service, too. Somerville Eastbound is still out for its DCA test. Uh, we had a sump pump problem, so they should be back on that later this week. And Abseekin, uh, the, the lone elevator there, was out overnight. Uh, somebody held the doors open too long, and it's back in service as of this morning. It's another Lincoln Homer.